from both ends. You are listening to The DP Show with Dimmy and Phil. And welcome, (laughs) welcome to another Tuesday night, 9 p.m. here you are ready to get DP'd with me, Phil, and we have, of course, uh, an animal <laughs> in the DP today. It's like it's like he like he knows that I we know. were going to go live. Like, for, oh, like he's right there meowing now. Did you for, hear him meow? Yeah, for thirty oh, minutes oh, he was oh, there. Oh, he didn't say anything while we were getting the show prepped, and as soon as we start, he's just all over it. See here, okay. Uh, and listen, I was just thinking. I just thought about you again. I mean, I think about you all the time. Oh, I just thought about you again so because sweet. I'm ready. See this mouse right here. Mm-hmm. You ready to break this it? This mouse is going to go. It's going to go in several, one of a few different <laughs> places. It might go in the toilet bowl. It might go. Um, it might go in the canal. It might go through a fucking window. <laughs> Although that would be a challenge because I have hurricane proof windows. Oh right. man, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry so, you had like, a mouse trouble. As I'm as I'm getting ready for the show, I I go over because. I don't need an expensive mouse here. I got. Yeah. I need a, a more expensive mouse on on my system back there because that's where I do all my video editing, right? Yeah. So I'm going to buy an inexpensive mouse. And I go over here to Amazon. I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'll just share the screen right here. Um, because, wait, we're, we're, there we go. Uh, and I thought about you because I'm looking at this mouse. I'm going to buy this mouse, right? But look at the look, look at the version they have. They have that version. Oops, I just and put, I might I put just myself, buy that on. version. Yes, let me put you. I just hit my, my button. Hold on. Wait, you push. You push okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so this, this is what the one I'm going to buy. But I, they have this version. Look at that. So I might just buy that version just so that I could think about you every time. I, I stroke the buttons. <laughs> you should. You should. Let me adjust the levels a little bit. Hear people saying a little bit loud. Okay. Oh, my God. It's okay. Keep going. Keep going. All right. Check, check. One, two, three. Everything's looking good on my end. Check, All right. check one, two, three. Yes, we're good. I just lowered the volume, the, the levels a little bit. Everything everything is fine. Back to this. Oh, Welcome. How are you doing, Phil? Oh, I'm just terrific. I'm terrific today. How are you? <laughs> I can tell that you've been having a wonderful day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But it's going to get better because tomorrow is another day and and uh, and things will get better. Uh, good tagline for the show. Thank you, you, my friend. Things are going to get better? Oh, really? Yes, that's, absolutely. That's a good tagline for the show considering what the show is about tonight? <laughs> yes. Oh, listen. Hey, uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say something. Yes. No, that's it. I just wanted to say something oh, okay. because you're probably going to be doing most of the talking tonight. No, 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 so no. Just... I, 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 do want, I do want to participate. Um, I, I want you to participate because, look, it's not all grim. You know me. I always put that my, a hint of positivity because what what I'm going to show you today is a culmination of three years' work. Like this presentation has evolved as the FDA guidance has evolved, right? Because it changes every week. So, but what I did try to do today is try to put a little positive pieces in there as we go along. Oh. Um, so the goal today is to. Let me get through the presentation. At which any point, you can jump in and we'll have a discussion on some of the stuff that I'm showing you. Okay. Then my goal is to end with some questions that mm-hmm. can't be answered. Okay. okay. And then we're going to take some calls. The phone lines will be open, 215-383-5752. 
Um, or you can post your questions in the chat, whether it be Facebook, Periscope, or YouTube, and Bill will collect the questions for me. You can ask me any question for the PMTA, and it doesn't cost you anything, and I will answer it to you honestly. Now, keep in mind that that's the most important fact, is that I'm going to answer it to you honestly at the best of my ability if I can answer it. If I can't answer it, I'll direct you to somebody that can answer it. But, uh, and then... Then we're going to give away the, I don't know if you saw, uh, for those of you that follow us on YouTube, we did a two-hour special uh, promoting Inikin from the Senjen show virtually. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're going to be doing the drawing for that. We're giving away uh, a scepter and an Aries 2. A, a, spect a spectator. A spectator. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, a skeptical. A skeptical. Spectator. That's a good one, a skeptical. Uh, and also, um, and also, if we, if we have time, maybe we'll give you some DP wheel. How about that? A DP wheel. That'd be fun. If we have I found, time. I found a new uh, show to binge watch. As a matter of fact, thank you very much uh, for allowing me to use your Netflix account. It's still on my TV. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, Great. Yeah, I'm going to get banned. I was using it today. All right. My levels look good on this side. Give me a check one time, uh, Phil. Everything check sounds Check one, two, perfect. three. Yeah, check good. one, two, yeah. three. Phil said it sounds really good. By the way, good tagline for the show. I can get this, this ready right here. Uh, if you think your ends are hurting now, Wait until after the show to really feel the DP impact. <laughs> so that's too long. That's too long of a tagline, Bill. <laughs> By the way, much I, appreciated I like to um, Bill Tarling for assisting us all, as always, with our shows and collecting your questions and all that. By the way, I want you, I want to get through the presentation because I might answer your question. So put the question there if you have it. But let me get through the show. Maybe I'll answer it, and then it will collect all the questions that you're going to have based on what I'm going to show you today. Or, or, um, um, or if you have questions that I have not maybe gone through uh, during this presentation. Can, can I say hello to, uh, to you, Larry? You can say hello to Larry, absolutely. And, and, and hello to everybody that's in the hello chat. Uh, we appreciate you hanging out. Appreciate Te Trey for the super chat as well, too. And if you do like the content that we provide for you here, a little like, a little share, a little love, there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe a million dollar super chat. That would work out really good for me and Phil. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, yeah, before we get started with that, Phil, I want you, uh, I want you to remind everyone where we're going to be September the 5th. Yeah, we're going to be at the, uh, the UVA uh, Save the Vape Rally. Uh, September 5th, it's going to be obviously in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, 1450 Pennsylvania Ave in the southwest quadrant of the Ellipse. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the event runs from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. Dimitri is uh, giving a speech. I am giving a speech. There's going to be a lot of other people uh, giving speeches as well. I'm not sure exactly uh, when we are going uh, on, but I know uh, our, our plans are normally we would just fly in and, like, spend a couple of days there because it's Washington. We would go see the sites. But actually, I'm going to fly to uh, to Dimitri's house, and we're going to drive from his house to the event, do the event, turn around, come right back home, get back as quick as possible. So yeah, that's that's the plan for the. And event. we have so, to. We, so we have please, to. I, I mean, if yeah. if you can go, please go. I mean, you know, the more people that can go, uh, the better. You know, try to try to like like we said in the show, be brave, put your big boy pants on, and get out there and support this. It's very very important. But if you can't do that, uh, uh, the UVA through their website and find out what you can do if you can't be there, okay? Very well said. Uh, by the way, we do have to come back because September the 5th is 60 days from my father-in-law, excuse me, six months from my father-in-law passing, and we, in, in Greek Orthodox, we do a ceremony, and we pushed it back for Sunday, so we need to get back Saturday night, and since you're going to be here, you're going to be able to participate as well, too, since you couldn't be at the funeral, so I think it'd be, it's nice. It's just a little, you know, just like a little, you know, you know whatever. Uh, with a priest there and all that. Maybe he'll give you a little blessing as well, too. <laughs> I don't know. That I could gonna... use that. Yeah, that'd be nice. Either that or you're going to burn down the church <laughs> when you walk in. <laughs> oh, poor Phil. All right. So, in all seriousness, uh, will uh, do you think uh, bans will be lifted in New York State? Not anytime soon. I think that any ban in any state that has been enacted... just. Wait, let me get through the show. I, I will talk about that. I'll talk that about that. I don't want to get distracted because I did, uh, did a lot of work. I did a lot of work. Uh, I'm looking forward. I haven't seen this presentation yet. 
Yeah, and I've changed it up. I've changed it up a little bit. Um, like I you said, you realize that the last time, the last time I saw a presentation from you for the first time when the presentation was given to somebody, I wanted to fucking hang myself yeah. because that was the presentation that you gave in China. That day. yes, yes, and and uh, and I, I, I briefly on that here. I try to make it a little bit more um, understandable for 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 people because I think it's really really critical when we're talking about the PMTA for people to understand what the PMTA is, okay? There's a lot of people that don't understand what a PMTA is, and then they they reply in Facebook threads or they tweet people or they tweet, tweet politicians with inaccurate info. And number one, A, that shows that you're not educated on the subject, and B, it also does not help our cause when you cannot explain to your legislator what is wrong with this process. People saying, oh, my God, I have to pay all this money to the FDA, for example, to get a PMTA. That's just not accurate because you don't pay the FDA anything, right? But when you tweet that to a politician, then the politician goes to the FDA. For example, let's say the politician does listen to you or your representative, and they go to the FDA and they say, well, this guy said that he has to pay all this money to the FDA. And the FDA says, uh, no, uh, PMTA is free. You know, they don't pay anything then, you know, who loses in that situation? Of course, the vaping industry does, and you lose credibility as well, too. And, and you know, I mean, Phil, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Over the years, this has been a huge problem. Misinformation has been probably a bigger problem for our industry than accurate information that's very, very limited. And that is because it is a baby industry, right? And it's very, very hard for us to be able to reach all the businesses and share this info or, or be on the same page. Just like in politics right now, there's just a huge division amongst us, whether it comes to advocacy businesses and stuff like that. Yeah, but I think I think that that's a growing trend, not just in the vapor industry. That's a growing trend with with everything. Misinformation is all over the place nowadays yeah. because because of the internet, right? Yeah. Because of the internet and because of all the social media and because they're all all of the platforms and because everybody has a voice and there are people out there who maybe shouldn't have a voice, right? Yeah, and I'm also um, concerned sometimes that people do misleading posts on purpose. You know, like this past week, I kept seeing the picture uh, that some people were posting. And again, this is not a Democrat or Republican thing. I do the same thing for Republicans and Democrats. They both suck. They both suck. <laughs> they're, they're both dirty motherfuckers, both of them. But the point is, I keep seeing a couple people post the Democratic convention with no masks. And they were using pictures that were taken from a previous Democratic event from like two years ago. Right. And they're telling people, look, oh, they're pushing masks, but they're not using masks. I just ended up unfriending people. And, and the good thing is, like, I have, like, 800 people waiting on my friend, Facebook friend list so I can add some of those people. But it's gotten to the point now where I, Facebook disgusts me. Like, 90% of my feed is just dirty. And, and I don't like it. I want to go back to, like, posting dildos and, shit, and funny shit like that. It makes, you know, it brightens my day. I, that, would, I, that, that would brighten my day, too. You, yeah. You, you notice, like, I've been so quiet on Facebook lately. Yeah, I haven't yeah, put a yeah, lot yeah. of stuff. Um, and you know what? Maybe that's a good idea. Maybe yeah. like just because I, a dildo a day, I get what a dildo a day, <laughs> a dildo a day keeps the uh, doctor away. <laughs> but like you, you put anything like this, this much political yes. or something that's not even political, but they, they yeah. turn it political. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Th th that's when you get like all kinds of interaction on your Facebook page yeah, because man. everybody's got a fucking opinion and everybody wants to put their opinion there. Uh, and maybe that's a good idea. Maybe I should put some uh, political there. And and kind of just weed some people out and yes. uh, add some more people to my friends list. That's exactly like what that's exactly what I've been doing. Years and years now, right? I've been snoozing people, which is great. That cleans up my feet a little bit. I got about nine hundred people on snooze right now, and then I've unfriended probably about thirty five people in the last two weeks. So I just go back to my list and I add new people. And then guess what? If I add you, like just the other day, I added a Greek guy. And as soon as I, he's been on my list for like six months waiting. And as soon as I add him, the first thing that he does is he puts me in a vape group. So I immediately unfriend him, send him a message. I said, bro, I said, the first thing you do is put me in a vape, block, delete, immediately just block him. The guy's apologizing on Instagram and all that. No, it's just, I don't have time for that. I don't no, have time for that. Larry's got it right. I think that Larry, Part of his witness protection program bans him from Facebook. Maybe that's what we need as well, too. We need a witness protection program to ban us Good from bit. Facebook. <laughs> By the way, I did invite the U.S. Attorney General Jerome Adams to watch today's show. 
and I hope he's watching. Maybe he can learn a, a thing or two, and maybe he can learn why a PMTA is not appropriate for the protection of public health as it's defined. And I hope he likes my shirt as well, too. So let's get right to it, Phil. Shall we? You ready? Yes, please, please. I'm, I'm ready. All right. So history of the pre-market tobacco application. Some of the references that I've used today, I want to thank, of course, uh, my uh, legal team at Keller and Heckman and Azim uh, in particularly. Also, the legal team at Morgan Lewis and Bocuse, uh, PMI Science, which is Philip Morris, uh, Global E-Vapor Consulting, which is my company, uh, have some quotes from Vaping360 as well, too. And of course, the lovely uh, website uh, from 1995, FDA.com. Gov. All right. Before you understand the PMTA, you have to understand the Tobacco Control Act. A lot of misinformation and a lot of false information being spread about the TCA as we know it, the Tobacco Control Act. The Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act is a federal statute in the United States that was signed into law by President Barack Obama on June 22, 2009. The act gives the Food and Drug Administration the power to regulate the tobacco industry. A signature element of the law imposes new warnings and labels in tobacco packaging and their advertisements with a goal of discouraging minors and young adults from smoking. The act also banned flavored cigarettes, placed limits on advertising of tobacco products to minors, and requires tobacco companies to seek FDA approval for new tobacco products. This also, the TSA, created the Center for Tobacco Products, also known as the CTP. This is a tobacco control center within the FDA, and it also gives the FDA authority to regulate the content, marketing, and sales of tobacco products that requires companies and importers to reveal all product ingredients and seek FDA approval for any new tobacco products. This also allows the FDA to change tobacco product content. The ban on flavoring applies to any product meeting the definition of a cigarette. This includes any tobacco that comes rolled in paper or non-tobacco substance. Calls for new rules to prevent sales except through direct face-to-face -face exchanges between a retailer and a consumer, it limits the advertise, uh, advertising that could attract young smokers, requires warnings to cover 50%, something that has been in courts for the last eight years between the big tobacco companies and, of course, the FDA, um, with also warning in capital letters. It also requires the FDA approval for the use of expressions such as light, mild, or low give the impression that a particular tobacco product poses less of a health risk unless a modified risk claim is applied for. Very important here to understand that this bill, the Tobacco Control Act, I have it highlighted and bold on the bottom, makes no provisions that ban the import of the banned items for personal consumption only for sale or distribution. Okay, now you can make what you want of that, but I think it's something that nobody, nobody is talking about. Hmm. Uh, one of the biggest misconceptions here, Phil, is people that have blamed Obama <laughs> for this. And, and again, within this industry, we have some really hard political people, um, for better or for worse. The Tobacco Control Act was not something that Obama just came up with, right? The Tobacco Control Act negotiation, because this is exactly what this was, this was a negotiation between Big Tobacco and the government, started 10 years before it was signed, right? So it started in 1999. People that were involved, Matt Myers, Campaign Tobacco Free Kids Now, Mid Zeller, Center for Tobacco Products Now, Philip Morris was the leading negotiator in these back and forths. So what they were trying to do is trying to negotiate a way of how we're going to grandfather cigarettes in and they're never going to be banned in America. Ultimately, that was the goal of the Tobacco Control Act. In fact, electronic cigarettes are only mentioned once in these thousands of pages of the Tobacco Control Act. Only once because they were, simply were not around. Right. Right. right? So... The purpose of this federal statute did not take into consideration that there possibly could be a product that comes out that will solve the cigarette. Okay, so yeah, and, and you again, have. What to, was what year was the uh, Tobacco Control Act? Two thousand and nine. It was signed into law. Okay? okay, but it didn't happen overnight, is what I'm saying. It was it a was ten-year negotiation, and again, 
I, I don't want to get really deep into the details. I'm telling you references where you can go and look it up and, and see how it started. And you can see some of the backroom deals and some a lot of lot of dirty work. You've often you have often heard me here on the show refer to it as the Philip Morris Protection Act or the Marlboro Protection Act, right? Uh, so the TSA, the TCA has also been called the Marlboro Protection Act because it grandfathered in tobacco products marketed before 2007 while erecting financial and regulatory barriers for the introduction of competing products to the U.S. market. These marketing restrictions enacted by the law make it more difficult to promote safer, smokeless alternatives to cigarettes. The restrictions have been disputed on the grounds of free speech, with some stating that the legislation violates the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Now, this is something that has been challenged multiple times. Uh, we've lost. <laughs> we've lost every time. But it's been challenged in various lawsuits, whether it be ours, the Right to Be Smoke Free Coalition, whether it was Nicopure, whether it's uh, USVA, whether it was Pacific Legal. And so far, it has lost. I mean, maybe if we take it all the way to the Supreme Court, we might get some relief there. But this is exactly what the Tobacco Control Act was. The Tobacco Control Act said, listen, you can do whatever you want to us. Put these stringent regulations. We'll, we'll start making settlements with, with the states, which master settlement agreement came after that. Uh, we'll, we'll pay off all the kind of money that you want. Raise all the taxes that you want. But please, if you're going to put competition on the market for us, then you got to make sure that that bar, in order for them to come onto the market, has to be set very, very high. Don't think for one minute, ladies and gentlemen, that language that was used in the Tobacco Control Act and eventually in some of the deeming rule that we see did not come from Philip Morris because it did. And again, they're a big corporation, multi-billion dollar corporation with shareholders, and they're trying to protect their interests. I don't say it with that I'm mad at them. You know, like O.J. Simpson, I understand. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> you know, if we had the same stakes and we had the same money, we probably would be doing the same thing. Okay. But don't think for one minute that the Tobacco Control Act was not a negotiation because that's exactly what it was. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to look at questions. I'm not going to look. I don't want to get sidetracked. So let me move on. Uh, I'll just, just keep them. Uh, just, I'll just keep them going. Um, so. We're introducing some new technology here, okay? The first cigarette-like e-cigarette models began entering the U.S. from China around 2007 to 2008. Big companies at the time, 21, uh, 21st century, uh, not 21st century, excuse me, smoking everywhere, Enjoy, uh, V2, Green Smoke. These are all companies that started bringing cigarette to America uh, between 2007 and 2008. I mean, if you were around at the time, you probably saw them pop up at malls. They had these little kiosks uh, all across America, and they were selling these two battery kits that were 90 mile apart, like $150 to $250 of these kits. They were making bank, a lot of money. So these products started to become more popular. The FDA initially tried to regulate them as drug delivery devices. They argued that they were intended to deliver nicotine, a drug, into the body and were not traditional tobacco products determined to be outside of the agency's authority. This was simply an attempt for the FDA to stop competition. Once again, I am explaining to you based on the Tobacco Control Act, what I told you earlier, here comes a competitor to big tobacco. Okay, here comes electronic cigarettes. So the FDA said the quickest way that we can do this is we're just going to call it a drug because it delivers nicotine to the body. And since drugs can only be marketed after receiving FDA approval, the agency's position at that time was that all e-cigarettes that contained nicotine were unapproved drug products that could not be marketed without explicit FDA approval. Based on this, the FDA in customs had several e-cigarette shipments from China seized, seized at the border. Those e-cigarette companies filed a lawsuit. By the way, at the time, Phil, at the time, Enjoy had a million and a half dollars, a million and a half dollars worth of product sitting at the customs. You know what? I'm, I mean, keep, keep in mind, they were working with 300 to 350 percent margins at the time. Right. OK. I mean, we're talking about a lot of money 
sitting there, okay? So, and other companies as well, smaller companies as well too. A couple of independent companies had some stuff caught up as well too. I think Rob Reagan, you know, from Vapor Kings in Oklahoma, I think it was one of the original guys as well too. But there were, there were uh, you know, Joe from iVape, you know, there were a few guys that had some product that was caught up in, in, in customs as well too, but no, no bigger than Enjoy. So those e-cigarette companies filed a lawsuit against the FDA, arguing that their products were actually not unapproved drugs at all, but tobacco products under the newly formed Tobacco Control Act. The Tobacco Control Act amended the existing Food and Drug Cosmetic Act to give FDA authority for the first time to regulate the manufacture, distribution, marketing of tobacco products in the United States. So importantly, the term tobacco product is defined broadly in the new law to include anything made or derived from tobacco intended for human consumption, including the components, parts, and accessories of the product. So that argument that the court ultimately agreed to, and this is in the case Soterra Inc. versus FDA, you can look that up and do some, uh, some uh, research on that if you wish, is that if an e-cigarette contains nicotine derived from tobacco and is customarily marketed for recreational use and not for any intended therapeutic benefit, then such e-cigarette is a tobacco product under the new law and it's subject to FDA's tobacco authority. So, kind of to explain that in layman's terms. The companies went to the court, judge and said, hey judge, we're not you know, to quit smoking with this, even though they were at the beginning. <laughs> what we're saying is that this is recreational nicotine. You like getting nicotine while you're smoking? Here's a way to get nicotine while you're vaping. It's basically an alternative. It's people to enjoy nicotine through an electronic cigarette. And the judge ruled in their favor. That judgment is a little, again, hazy, a little gray, because the judge did not specifically say that you're a tobacco product, but told the FDA that you cannot regulate this as a drug, but you may be able to regulate it under the full, you know, Tobacco Control Act, which covers products that are made or derived from tobacco. And what follows next is the next slide. Make sure I've got. Uh, are you are you are you following so far? Am I say am I explaining it good? Phil, if I'm not explaining it, um, no, you are. As a okay. matter of fact, I'm uh, I'm making some notes here, and I'm going to have some questions too. Okay, perfect. I just want to make sure I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, okay. So, where were we? Uh, okay. So, how did we get to deemed right deemed product? This is how, this is what we are. Electronic cigarettes were a deemed um uh, product. The TCA that also gave the FDA the ability to use its rulemaking procedures to create a regulation that would deem other currently unregulated tobacco products under its tobacco authority. So basically what this says is, look, there might be some products out there that were not covered in the Tobacco Control Act because of new technology and so forth and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to give the FDA pretty much the discretion to go after products and deem them a tobacco product if they're made or derived from nicotine okay so on april 25th 2011 the fda published a letter to the e-cigarette stakeholders on its website stating that it would not appeal the judge's decision and that e-cigarettes made with tobacco derived nicotine would be deemed to be under the fda's tobacco authority by the deeming regulation and then exactly three years later uh in april 25th 2014 you know, when all the news uh, busted out here in, in America, the FDA finally published a notice of proposed rulemaking for the deeming regulation. I think it's important to note here, uh, not that note that you see there, but the, I think what's important to note here is that in 2014, the FDA came out and said, we're bringing regulations. We're deeming you a tobacco product. We're not going to challenge the court. Okay, we're not going to go after you. Is that me or you? We're not going to go after you as, as a, a drug. We're going to go after you as a tobacco product. So that's when we, meaning me and Phil, uh, actually went to China and we told them, hey, listen, the, <laughs> this is 2014, folks. This is six years ago, okay? I don't want to hear no shit. We didn't know, all right? In 2014, me and Phil went to China. We gave a presentation to the Chinese and we said, listen, based on what we see here on the tobacco control act the fda can come out with regulations that we have to do this and this and this and this because it is in the tobacco control act that the pre-market tobacco application is a very very high threshold of course all the chinese laughed they said that's impossible i mean we're in a communist country and they're laughing because they don't believe that 
there could possibly be a law that's that stringent to allow a product to come into the market. The irony in this is killing me. It's almost like if Americans are not allowed in China because of COVID. <laughs> um, so back to the note. <laughs> back to the note here. Uh, important note, the Tobacco Control Act did not give FDA the immediate ability to regulate those products, okay? So the FDA couldn't just wake up tomorrow and say, well, e-cigs are regulated, okay? Because the law only gave them immediate authority to regulate four specific types of products. Cigarettes, cigarette tobacco, smokeless tobacco, and roll your own. Now, Phil, question. This is a little quiz time for you. <laughs> um, out of these four products, okay, this is what the, the, F, the FDA immediately grasped onto to regulate, immediately, because this is what the law said. Anything, uh, any other product that would have to go through the rulemaking process, create a deeming rule, open it for comment, receive comments, talk to the stakeholders, and then come up with deeming regulations. Out of these four products, cigarettes, cigarette tobacco, smokeless tobacco, and roll your own tobacco, which one of these four categories we had independents in America? We had independent shops in America out of roll these four own. products. Roll your own, right? Yeah. Roll your own, yeah. And what happened to roll your own immediately when the FDA took over? It went bye-bye. Oh, overnight, just yeah. like that. I know there's some people in the chat today that actually had Roll Your Own shops. And they will tell you, as soon as the FDA came in, all competition seized. Guess what's safe? Cigarettes, smokeless tobacco, cigarette tobacco, still safe. Still sold in every corner in America. I, I, know, this, I know it's a big prelude, prelude to, the, to the PMTA, but I think it's very important to understand the beginning of it. And that's why I'm trying to break it down into a way that everybody understands uh, where it came from. Uh, Bill, I'm, I'm just gonna, not going to look at the questions because it's going to throw me off. I'll look at them afterwards because I'm going to cover some of that stuff as well, too. Who's texting me? Um, they know I'm it's, doing a it's show. It's Jerome. See if it's Jerome. It might be Jerome. Hold on. Let me check. Yeah, sure you better, you better double check. Here. Is it? Uh, Death threats? Anything like that? PMTA questions? Who would, who would text me about that? I, I don't know who. All right. No. Drive me crazy. All right. So now we're moving into market authorizations. Okay? So I gave you the prelude to how we got to the PMTA based on the Tobacco Control Act because this is where it all started. It all started back in 1999. It didn't start today. Tobacco products marketed before February 5th, 2007 are grandfather products. That date is very, very important. What the government negotiated with the tobacco companies, they said at 2009, when we signed the Tobacco Control Act, because it took two years to get this thing through Congress and the House and all that, and eventually make it into a federal statute and Obama to sign it. But what the law said at the time said, listen, by the time this thing passes, every product that was on the market prior to February 15th, 2007, is grandfathered in. You're not going to have to go through this process. Everything is grandfathered in. All your cigarettes, anything that you have filed will be grandfathered in. They're safe. <laughs> the number one killer in America will be safe. New tobacco products must be marketed pursuant to a market authorization, meaning anything that comes after that will have to have a market authorization. Any entity that wishes to market a new tobacco product and or those that cannot produce evidence to show that its product was on the market as of the grandfather date must submit one type of three uh, types of market authorizations prior to entering the market. The pre-market tobacco product application, the substantial equivalence or other known as SC or exemption from SZ. And then the term PMTA that's being thrown around now uh, was, was born. For us, we don't have exemption from SC. We just, that's not a viable avenue for us because we're a product that's, divide, that's derived from nicotine. So that leaves us with two, two pathways to the market. Um, based on the Tobacco Control Act, the Substantial Equivalence Report and the Pre-Market Tobacco Act Product Application, also known as PMTA, are the only two viable pathways for vapor products. The less onerous, of course, is the SC, right, the Substantial Equivalence, which requires demonstrating that a new product is substantially equivalent to a product that was on the market as of the grandfather date set forth in the statute. I'm going to turn my phone on. Um, 
Everything all right? You okay? Yeah, I don't. I don't. Yeah. I just uh, people. All right. So uh, it's PMT, PMTA stuff. All right. I figured. So um, where was I? Grandfather date set for February fifteenth, two thousand seven. So. The substantial equivalent standard requires showing that any characteristic of this new product that you're putting on the market that are not identical to the grandfather predicate product do not raise different questions of public health, right? So it is our opinion, and I think that everybody's opinion, that there is no product on the market today, right, that was on the market on February 15th, 2007. And there's really no product that we can... We, we can we can compare to we I mean we can say that this product is a vapor electronic cigarette and it didn't really change from 2007 but the character characteristics have changed the technology has changed the software has changed the resistance has changed so it would be very hard to prove as many attorneys will tell you that were substantially equivalent to anything that was on the market prior to February 15th, 2007. Not only do we have to be on the market, but we have to be able to prove that your product was marketed before 2007. I hear some stuff again, some chatter. Oh, you know, decaying was around and all that. I was going to ask that. that. That was actually a question that I just wrote, wrote down. Yeah. So I hear this all the time, right? Well, decaying was, you know, where they selling product legally can you prove that you were marketing your product in the united states prior to 2007 or february 15 there's a lot of questions here that are unanswered right it's not like you can just go up to the fda and say hey listen man i went to this website it was you know esig.cn and i bought some decaying liquid and uh, and that's not going to be sufficient it's my humble opinion again i'm not an attorney please don't take this as legal advice anything that we say today uh, uh, it's just my opinion, and it's not the opinion of Phil Busardo or the DP show. But I do want to tell you that my opinion, I don't think that there's a product on the market today that would meet the SC. And like me, I've talked to various attorneys about the subject, and they agree with me. Uh, and just like I said, if you see here, unless the FDA uses a new grandfather date for e-cigarettes, which they didn't, the SC report process will not be available for these products since it does not appear that there were any e-cigarettes on the market on February 15th. 2007 and i agree with him i don't think necessarily that was any product on that market at that date that we can market that we can show that would market that was marketed and we can compare it to any product that we have on the market today need nicotine nicotine is a wonderful drug all right a little closer look to the pmta the pmta pathway is the most Right. This is the second pathway that we had. We said SC is not an option for us. The PMTA pathway is the most onerous pathway with industry estimating the cost of compiling the science and preparing the application at about $1 million per SKU. And I will break it down that for you later. Well, don't start jumping on me. Okay. All right, fuckers. Don't start jumping on me. I will show you because every time that I say something, I always have shit to back it up. It should be noted that FDA will not charge a user fee to submit the PMTA. Again, another misconception that we talked about at the beginning of the show. Of course, this estimated cost is due to the effort involved with compiling the science and preparing the regulatory submission. That's the bad news, right? <laughs> the bad news is about a million dollars per skew. Nevertheless, though, the FDA has publicly recognized that the aerosol exhaled by electronic nicotine delivery systems is potentially less harmful than secondhand smoke from cigarettes. Potentially. Yes. And they're on the record, as I'm going to show you here. Director Zeller, right, from the Center for Tobacco Products, has stated that some addicted adult smokers use these products with a goal to end their smoking habits and that a mass market exit of vapor products would limit the availability of a potentially less harmful alternative for adult smokers seeking to transition or stay away from cigarettes. Zeller also maintained that reducing availability of these products could present a serious risk that adults, especially former smokers who currently use vapor products and are addicted to nicotine, would migrate to cigarettes. He warned this was a public health outcome that should be avoided if all at possible and that these products may be less harmful at an individual level than combustible, to, than combustible tobacco products. And it is likely that some ENDS products may reduce harm at that individual level. Now, you're going to say, Phil, wow, 
you know, the language is a little wishy-washy. It is for a good reason. Because based on the Tobacco Control Act, if I'm going to put a product on the market that appears, as he says, to help adult people quit smoking and that it's less harmful than cigarettes, I have to prove to the FDA through the pre-market tobacco application that that is valid. The FDA has to look at the science and then they may have to make a determination to allow your product to be sold on the market. Okay? People need to understand that FDA is not stupid. Scientists are not stupid. They understand that exhaled vapor is less toxic than combustible smoke. Okay? Stop with the fuck the FDAs and stop with as much as I hate them, you know, as much as I hate our all of public health and all of every I hate everybody right now. <laughs> Um, we have to be a little bit more fair as an industry. We need to understand the process and why the FDA is taking a cautious approach, especially when they see the rise of youth using these products, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. The good news is that we have, they understand the product value. They don't understand how the product works. And the Tobacco Control Act only gave them one way based on the law, to approve these products on the market. Now, they have FDA discretion. They have a lot of stuff that they can use, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But this is good. This is part of the good stuff that I'm trying to kind of throw in there to give everybody some... Uh, I'm taking too long. I should move a little bit faster. All right. So a closer look to the PMTA. Section 910 of the FDCA requires the FDA to determine the product is appropriate for the protection of the public health, taking into account risks and benefits to the population as a whole, including users and non-users. What's really unique here, Phil, is that this standard of taking into account the risks and benefits of the population as a whole makes the department, the Center for Tobacco Products, unique because all the other centers that were within the FDA only assesses risks and benefits to specific users of the products. So what they're saying here is that all the other centers that are part of the FDA, when they look at a product, they look at the product on how the users of that product actually use it and what the benefits are, are or not. In our case, in our case, very unfairly so, what it's saying is that not only do you have to prove that your product is safer than smoking, you also have to prove to me what effect it's gonna have in the population as a whole, meaning smokers, non-smokers, kids, heavy smokers. You have to take in consideration everybody, somebody that's gonna initiate use with your product, somebody that's gonna switch with your product, somebody that eventually might quit with your product. It's just a burdensome, onerous procedure that only happens within the center of tobacco products. Nevertheless, again, a little bit of good news here. The FDA has indicated that it expects to approve PMTA applications for ENDS products. The public health standard will not amount to a complete block to product approval for the industry. I can translate that to good and bad news. The good news is that they have indicated that they're probably going to approve some ENDS. Bad news is that just don't know which companies and which ones are going to be able to meet that huge threshold of a PMTA. Let's hope it's one of ours. So far, the FDA has only approved two PMTAs. <laughs> since uh, since that, this just to clarify, that's that's approved, not accepted. Approved. B big right. difference there, right? Correct. Absolutely. Okay. One contained eight Swedish match snooze products, and one was, of course, for a heat not burn product, the IQOS. Um, these two applications provided some guidance for our industry, if you look at them. A very expensive guidance, <laughs> if you look at the work that these companies have done. But at least, nonetheless, it gave us some guidance. But the application, due to the humongous amount of different types in our industry, is limited, okay? There's really little or no absolute background and understanding on how to apply a standard for vapor products when there are no standards. It's standards that the industry has to create. This is a little uh, chart that you're gonna see. Uh, this is up to June of 2020, so we don't have the updated numbers now. Marketing orders two, obviously. Uh, we've had no marketing orders six. Refused to accept, meaning refused outright 371. 
refused to file. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. Seven withdrawn three total applications received uh, as of June 2020, 650. We need to understand what a finished tobacco product is as well, too. This is very, very important. A tobacco product is any product made or derived from tobacco that is intended for human consumption, including any component, part, or accessory of a tobacco product. The term is not limited to products containing tobacco or tobacco, or tobacco derivatives, but also includes components, parts, or accessories of tobacco products, whether they are sold for further manufacturing or for consumer use. For example, e-liquids, aerosolizing apparatus, Atomizers and batteries used in ends are tobacco products. Whether they're sold to consumers for use in an ends or are sold for further manufacturing into another product sold to the consumer. Very, very important to understand here that components are captured if they alter the finished tobacco product. Okay, so if it's used in ends, right, it's a component, then based on that component, the language captures atomizers, tanks, and so forth. The term finished tobacco product refers to tobacco product including all components and parts sealed in final packaging intended for consumer use. Very, very important in the language here. For example, an e-liquid sealed in final packaging that is to be sold or distributed to a consumer for use is a finished tobacco product. But in contrast, an e-liquid that is sold or distributed for further manufacturing into a finished ends product is not itself a finished tobacco product. So what it's saying here is that the components that go into you making this liquid are not captured. They don't need a PMTA. But the final tobacco product that you're going to create and seal and give to the customer um, needs to have a PMTA, which let me show you the next slide, and I'm going to tell you why I bring this up. The largest issue that we have here, right, in regards to components is the determination as to whether a product is a component. And I don't think anybody knows. If people will tell you they know. There's a lot of smart asses on YouTube, wannabe lawyers on YouTube that, that try to give you. And I will tell you, as Demetrius, I will be a bigger man and I'll tell you that I don't know <laughs> because this is the truth. They're just gray areas with regard to whether a component will alter or affect the tobacco product's performance. Uh, its composition, constituents, or characteristics, and whether the product will be used with or for the consumption of a tobacco product. Furthermore, there's a question as to whether FDA's extension of its tobacco authority to these products and also to programmable software, batteries, digital display lights, glass or plastic vials is a proper use for its authority. Because components and parts are deemed to be tobacco products, they are subject to the same requirements as a tobacco product. Now, Phil, the reason, again, why I bring this up here is just a very, very gray area. The only way that you can do really is either meet with the FDA ahead of time and go through a strenuous process of trying to get some answers for them. And I'm going to tell you something. I've been there. It doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. The FDA does not answer questions in their meetings. The FDA only asks questions in their meeting, right? And they make suggestions of what you could possibly do. But if you ask a question to the FDA and say, hey, listen, FDA, is this drip tip a tobacco product? The FDA is going to answer you with a question. They're going to say, well, does it meet the definition of a component as it's based on the Tobacco Control Act, right? So this is the way that the FDA works. There's no direct guidance on this industry because they simply don't understand. They haven't grasped the entirety of the technology and these products as a whole. If they can't answer the questions, how do you go through the process? Drop, or you just drop your voice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, I'm, and I can't answer it. I mean, you, you will have to apply for that product and see what happens with the FDA. I mean, it's it's... Or you have to make the determination and say, hey, look, my product is not a component of tobacco product and stick with it. You know what I'm saying? You have to go, if you're going to go that route, you're going to have to say, I'm determined. I don't sell my product with any nicotine. I don't think that the FDA has any authority over it. And then if you do get a warning letter and you want to challenge it, then you better have some money. It's going like, to cost money. Because Enjoy did the same thing with the Sonterra case. Enjoy stepped in and saved the Sonterra case. Originally, Enjoy was not the lead plaintiff on this, but the company that did sue the FDA ran out of money. I mean, you're fighting the federal government here, boys. They have the Department of Justice, the yeah. DOJ that's defending them. doesn't cost them a thing. In fact, you know who pays for it? You. <laughs> you, the taxpayer, are paying to defend that lawsuit. 
So if Angeli hadn't stepped in at the time and funded the rest of that lawsuit, that wouldn't have been good for the industry. It would be a whole different landscape in vaping right now. So components, again, a, a, a huge gray area. Um, yeah. All right. So let me get back to this. <laughs> Getting sidetracked again. Um, here are some deadlines that you should know. Or, and hopefully, if you're following a PMTA, you have gone through these steps. Um, August 8th of 2016 is when the sample ban went into effect immediately. Age restriction became a thing for vapor products federally. 18 at the time. That, that of course, has been changed to 21 now. Photo ID check, use of modified risk, uh, reduced risk claims is um, gone, meaning you can't say my product is safer than tobacco. Uh, and of course, misbranding and adulteration came into place where we saw warning letters come out for bad labeling or misbranding of your product. It also kicked into effect the prohibition of introduction of new uh, deemed products without pre-market authorization. We saw how that will that work. There's a million assault nick lines on the market right now, but any product that came out after August 8th of 2016, technically, is illegal, misbranded, and adulterated. Who is calling oh. me? Is What's that you? That? <laughs> that can't be me. That's it's not me. Where's that coming from? I don't know. Is that Skype? Sorry. Second. Let me see who's calling. I don't see Does that sound like Skype? End. Does that sound like Skype? Can't be Skype. What is that? What is that? I've never heard the sound before. Right. I, 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 check, make sure it's not Jerome. <laughs> that could be Jerome calling in. <laughs> No, it's not the phone lines. There's nobody on the phone lines. Um, did that sound like the messenger on, on Facebook? No. Hmm. All right. I think it's Google. I think it was Google. Okay. All right, whatever. It might have been somebody trying to sell me something from China. Some pre-August 8th, 2016 product. All right. <laughs> Back to this. All right. As we said, August 8th, 2016 is when all that kicked in. Then, September 30th, 2017, all U.S. manufacturing establishments should be registered with the FDA and including their product list submission. So you should register your products with the FDA and register your U.S. manufacturing establishments. Um, by the way, all these steps needed to be done leading up to you following a PMTA now. All right. We did see some inspections between, you know, 2018, 2019. We saw some inspections to some of those U.S. manufacturing establishments. I haven't heard of any being given out. I think what the FDA was doing more so is going out to the industry, collecting data and seeing how these products are being produced. So I don't necessarily think that. What did I put up there? God, I'm so bad today. I'm sorry. It's OK. Uh, my mind's okay. just all over the place. Um. But we did see some inspections going on in facilities and stuff like that. And mostly it was just as the inspectors told them, them ourselves, they were just reaching out to, to get more data and understand the industry better. February 8th of 2017, you must have submitted your health documents. If you haven't done this, it's part of the requirement of you and a PMTA. Now, this, the health documents basically wanted from a period of time, which is around eight months, for you to submit to the FDA if you have any health documents to submit. None of the industry had any health documents. So all you had to do is just send in a form that says, I, we don't have any health documents. That's all you had to do. But you have to do it. Or you should have met that deadline, February 8th of 2017. In November 8th of 2017, we had submission of ingredient listing, which I hope, again, the companies did at the time. November 8th of 2019, we had a huge deadline for submission of harmful and potentially harmful constituents. This, I swear to God, I'm so pissed. I'm so pissed about this because we put in a lot of work and effort trying to get Chinese companies to comply. We went to the FDA. We said, there's no way that the Chinese hardware companies can file ingredient listing. And we fought with them back and forth through legal, through attorneys, through contacting the FDA. We tried to work with China to come up with a way that they can file the ingredient, their HPACs. The FDA said no. So we pushed and pushed and pushed until 24 hours before the deadline. The FDA says, um, 
uh, you don't have to do it. We're, we're going to push. I mean, it, it was such a stressful time for me at, at that, that, that current time trying to get this thing done. And then what the FDA did, again, I think that there should be some repercussions. For, I think that, that we should hold the FDA liable for the amount of money, personnel, all the work that we did leading up to that. Chinese companies had to hire more more um, more staff. They, they had to come up with a way of how to do, you know, it was just it was it was just absolutely crazy. All right, so this was kicked back. All right, the potentially harmful uh, constituents HBHCs, uh, and it was kicked kicked back for everybody. August eighth of twenty eighteen. I see that there's a caller. Just please just be patient with me. Let me get through this, and I'll get your call. If you want to call, it's fine. If you don't want to wait, uh, August tenth of twenty eighteen kicked in the warning labels. All right, nicotine addiction. All then you know we went through all this. You know how big is going to be the label front and back bottle. We went through all this. The the um, the industry though most of the industry through all these steps feel that complied, you know they complied. Yep. Which leads us to September 9th of 2020, which is coming up 14 days. 14 days starting tomorrow. Uh, originally it was set for August 8th of 2022. Uh, the original deadline, okay, was set August of 2018. I think a lot of people forget that they're complaining now for the 2020 deadline, but the original deadline was August 28th of 18. Then former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb rolled back the PMTA deadlines to August of 2022. He realized, Phil, that there's just no way that we can get this information in the FDA. We're not prepared. We cannot accept applications. Companies cannot file applications. He understood that vapor products are less harmful than cigarettes, so he gave us a four-year extension. But our wonderful public health groups including Parents versus Vape, um, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, and other uh, just wonderful health organizations that care about American citizens, took that FDA uh, extension and challenged it in court and was granted summary judgment where the judge pushed back the submission to May 12th of 2020, which is another thing that people... First deadline passed. Right. Then, due to COVID, of course... At the FDA request, the district court changed the deadline to September 9th of 2020, which leads us into the to where we are today. Um, so let me just pause there for a second and say that in all those deadlines, okay, this process started in 2014. It's been six years through all this. The, the one thing that the FDA has not made clear is how to follow PMTA. <laughs> okay, we can, I mean, they've got a lot of requests, but there's still not a clear definition of how we're going to be able to submit a PMTA, especially when there's no predicate for us to look at. We can only look at IQOS and we can look at Swedish Match, and then we can look at kind of the, the, the guidance that they have given there and try to assemble a PMTA. All right, should I take this call or should I just wait? What do you think? Well, I got a bunch of questions too. How, how much longer is the presentation? I've got... Seven more slides. Okay, eight, take eight a call. Slides. Break it up a little bit. I need time to get some nicotine. Three, two, three, you're on the air. Hello, anybody home? Hey, buddy, what's going on, man? This is a voice from your distant past. Do you <laughs> know who it is? I know absolutely who it is, buddy. How's it going? I'm doing good. How are you? Are you in China or are you here? No, I got out three days before uh, everything went to hell. Well, that's good. At least you got back out, in, Skinny. That's good. Back back in January, so I've been stuck here. Oh, I bet you hate it. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm kind of enjoying it, but I do miss uh, being over there. Yeah. So what's up? Uh, so, so anyway, um, I don't know if you covered this. Um I kind of came in on this late, but I keep hearing conflicting information about what can actually go into the PMTA and what cannot. So my understanding is, is that you have the uh, products that are similar to what was available in 2007, and then when the, um, <clears throat> when the actual ruling dropped from that point forward, uh, products aren't allowed. So, could you clarify that for me? Yeah, I covered a little bit. Questions? Yeah, I covered a little bit earlier. I mean, if you do have any products on the market today that were commercially marketed in the United States prior to February fifteenth of two thousand seven, you don't need a PMTA. Right. 
uh, what about like products that come out in like the last you know year or ten months or nine months? Or Technically, you cannot week. follow PMTA for those either. Technically, the cutoff date was August eighth of twenty sixteen. Now, having said that, there were some companies that did some. Uh, small launches prior to that date, okay? There's some companies that sold some small batches of products that they were planning on to release in 2017 and 2018. You know, how accurate that is and how valid that is. Again, I, I'm just telling you what I've seen in the market or what people have said. But technically, products that are following PMTA today need to be on the market prior to August 8th of 2016 if you want to continue to sell them. That doesn't mean you cannot put a new product that came out this year for a PMTA. You just can't sell it until you get market authorization. Does that make sense? Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. So basically what I'm saying is okay. that if, if me and Phil came out tomorrow with a DP electronic cigarette. Sounds hot. It's hot. That's hot. That's a hot idea, Brian. Make it happen. Yeah. You can get it from both ends. Right. You can put you hey listen, you can put nicotine from both ends. If we came up with a, a DP electronic cigarette today, I can file a PMTA. I just can't legally sell it in America. I can sell it in other countries and go through the PMTA process as well too and tell the FDA that I've got a new product that's coming on the market and the FDA is going to say, "Okay, well if you meet the threshold, file a PMTA. If you get market authorization, you can sell it." So that, that's the difference between pro products prior to August of 2016. They can continue to sell in the market today while you're going through the application versus of you filing something new. How about, uh, can I jump in? Hey, Brian, how you doing? Can I jump in here? How about a product prior? Right. Okay. You, Love you too, Brian. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for calling hey, in. What about a, a product that's prior that was accepted for a PMTA? Can that continue to be sold? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll cover that in a little bit. Okay. So, so if we have uh, the the DP um, the DP vaporizer, yeah. and we put it on the market uh, a month ago, yes. But we also filed the PMTA and it was accepted. We can continue to sell it. No. 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 Because you no no you can't. The product in your PMTA in your PM, when you're filing a PMTA, you have to show that the product was on the market prior to August eighth, twenty sixteen. Okay. In order for you to continue to sell it, it's part of your cover letter. It's part of what you need to, to submit to the FDA. So that means that you can file 10 products that were prior to the market of August 2016, and you can file 10 products that came after. The only ones that you can legally sell are the products that were prior to August 8th of 2016. Even if the PMTA is accepted? Correct. Okay. While it's under review, the product, if it does not meet the predicate date, needs to be not sold until the market review comes out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and I said prior, I, I misspoke. It should have been I understand. after. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, some of the <laughs> dual penetration e cig. <laughs> that's just fantastic. I think that's a brilliant idea, by the way. Let's make that happen. Um, here we go. PMTA requirements. All right. These are the mandatory statutory requirements, and I'm going to break them down to you in a more easy way to understand. This is the FDA's terminology. Full reports of all information published to or known to, which would reasonably be known to the applicant concerning investigations which have made to show the health risks of your tobacco product. And if your tobacco product presents less risk than other tobacco products, a full statement of the tobacco products, components, ingredients, additives, properties, and principles of operation, a full description of the methods used in the facilities and controls used to manufacture the product. An identifying reference to any tobacco product standard, which would be applicable to any aspect of such tobacco product and either adequate information to show that uh, such aspect of such tobacco product fully meets, meets the standard or adequate information to justify any deviation from such standard. Such samples of tobacco products and components thereof, uh, as the secretary may reasonably require, meaning you give them samples of your product, specimens of the labeling. Uh, that's going to be used on the product and other information relevant to that subject matter as the secretary may require. And you're like, oh, bed, that sounds easy. Easy, easy, peasy, oh, so squeezy. <laughs> the FDA even helped. The FDA helped by creating a docket, issuing guidance that's been updated three times since it came out. And here it is. No, Who's that guy? Uh, I don't know. Some guy on my Facebook. Uh, and here it is. This is the draft guidance. It's 53 pages that kind of, you know, goes through 
some examples, recommendations, and minimum statutory requirements. So the FDA was very, very kind to put that out there. Not very clear, clear, uh, not a lot of clarity in that guidance, but nonetheless, they said, you know, we're doing our part and we're giving you some guidance. In this guidance, the FDA is currently thinking on these applications to improve the efficiency of application sum uh, submission and review. However, the recommendations in this guidance are non-binding. So even the guidance that the FDA puts out says, you know, you can do everything that we say on this guidance and you still might not get it. Right? That's exactly what non-binding means. When the FDA reviews PMTA spreads, it will base decisions on the obligations that arise from the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and its implementing regulations. FDA anticipates that the experience gained through the publication of this guidance and review of PMTAs may contribute to future rulemaking and guidances. So here what they're saying is that we're going to get a lot of information from the stakeholders, right? So once we get this information in, we'll look at it as FDA, and maybe based on what you've submitted, maybe standards, you know, operating procedures... Uh, potentially harmful constituents will come from your own applications and the FDA will be assisted to be able to uh, regulate this product better. I'm going to break it down to you a little bit easy, right? These are the seven minimum statutory requirements for a PMTA. Administrative, summary, product description and manufacturing, which includes design, specifications, HPHC testing, constituents, and so forth, non-clinical work, product imp impact on individual health, product impact on population health, and environmental impact. These are all based on the statute of the Tobacco Control Act that gave FDA the authority to create this path. These seven must be met. And out of these seven, really, a couple of the hardest ones is number seven, the environmental impact, where you have to show what impact every individual SKU you have on the market will bring to the environment, right? It's a very strenuous process. And number three, Number three is the most difficult one if you base it on HPHC and testing. And you're going to say, Dimitri, what is product description and manufacturing? I mean, what would you think when we're talking about this field? It says product description and manufacturing. But if you look at that subcategory sub of, of the FDA, which I'm going to bring up here, right? You say product analysis and manufacturing. This is you know, based on step three. It talks about HPHC testing in here. It gives you actually repetitions and batches for testing your product. You need to be able to show them, A, what the ingredients are. And you know how difficult it is to show them what ingredients are? Because when you create a liquid, it's not just for ingredients, unlike most of this industry that keeps saying. If you have a liquid that has three flavorings inside, there's probably 600 constituents, 600 different constituents in that liquid. Because talking make, about like the, we have to go down to the molecule? Down to the molecule. Yeah. And the FDA is requiring you to, to supply cast numbers for the ingredients that you're using. One strawberry can have 200 different chemicals to create one strawberry that you're using in that. Not only that, but you also have to show what happens when you combine these products. Meaning, if I'm going to take strawberry, fills juice, put it together, I'm making a finished tobacco product, I have to show what's in that final liquid product, which requires testing. And testing is expensive, folks. Right? I will show you here, but people say there's not an HPHC list. Yes, they are. If you look here on the FDA website, in the guidance, they actually recommend that you consider the following constituents for analysis in e-liquids and aerosols. This argument that HPHC testing is not required is completely, I don't know who came up with that. HPHC testing is required. Now, I get it. It's COVID. It's expensive. It's this. It's that. I get it. But this part, this recommendation from the FDA is, is clear to me that you're going to have to show to the FDA what is your finish, what is the, the HPHC levels in your finished tobacco product that you put on the market. And the list is long. It's long. Look, at. I mean, there's a lot of shit for you to test here. Okay. Not only is it a lot of shit from you, they're also, they're also telling you that, hey, maybe you should test it seven times, seven repetitions, two regimes, two batches, high and low, because there's some bridging there that you can do some bridging. But they're, they're actually recommending to you how to test your liquid as well, too, even though, once again, there is no standard. Yes, go ahead, Phil. Question. You, uh, you, you keep mentioning that, that testing, and there's an acronym that goes with that testing. What does that acronym stand for? It's harmful and potentially harmful constituents. So it's basically a list 
of things that could potentially be harmful if they're inside the liquid. Because every time I hear that, all I hear is HVAC. And, and, and <laughs> yeah. That doesn't make any sense. So HP, HC, I'm on. sorry, yes. HVAC. Um, uh, the, the, again, there is no set list. So the FDA hasn't actually even created a list of telling you that you can't have this in your liquid. This is potentially harmful. They don't know. It's going to take them 10 years to come out with that list, but they have made a recommendation. And us as an industry, what we should do is say, look at this list and say, well, this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit liquid. So we need to make our own HBAC list. And we need to say, okay, well, we've seen testing in Europe. We've seen testing in other countries. We make liquid. We know that this is what we should be looking for. There's no reason for us to be looking for, uh, for example, a constituent that you find in rolled tobacco or in dry tobacco, I should say versus a need liquid, okay? So we can create a protocol and say, this is why we're testing it like this, and this is why we're only testing it two times or three times, because we don't need seven times. We should create these protocols and submit them with our PMTA and go to the FDA and say, look, what you're asking for is not reasonable. This is what the entire industry is doing above and beyond. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't know yeah. if, if they're doing it. I see you're on call 973. Let me get through this and I'll get to you in just a second. Um, I want to finish this because people don't understand the costs that are involved. Okay, when we say when we say that it's about a million dollars per SKU, it's true. It's true. At minimum, half a million dollars. Well, how do you come up with that, Dimitri? These are actual quotes. I'm not going to tell you from where, <laughs> but uh, these are actual. I've actually copied and pasted this from a quote from a lab. HBC testing in liquid. This is just the testing in liquid. Two SKUs. Three batches, seven reps, one regime, $26,250. Two SKUs. And you know why they say two SKUs? Because you take the high and the low, and then you average them out. So one flavor, you take the highest nicotine and the lowest nicotine, you do the testing, then you average it together, $26,250. Testing in aerosol, emissions, right? Because vaping is not just the liquid. Folks, when you vaporize it, the emissions is what the important part is, right? So first we have to look at what the liquid is, your, finest, your finished tobacco product. Then we have to look at when you actually vaporize it, what those emissions put out. So there's two testings that need to be done. And aerosol testing is very, very expensive and very limited in the labs that can do it because they're not, they don't know how to test vapor products. They know how to test cigarettes, but they can't test their, well, not a lot of them know how to. So two SKUs, three batches, seven reps, two regimes. $88,000. So I'm going to give you a little estimate here. If you have brand A, let's say Fields French PP Tears a la mode. Delicious. Delicious. I need to make some more. I'm almost out. Four flavors. Okay. So it's a brand A that has four flavors. All right. The calculations would be four times 114,450 would equal to 457,800. Plus stability testing. Stability testing is approximately fifteen hundred per skew, bringing us to a total cost. If you took this lab, <laughs> um, bringing a total cost just for HPHC testing and stability, close to half a million dollars. Phil, okay, this is for four flavors of brand A, right? So you can imagine if I'm a small shop or a small manufacturer and I have twenty flavors. And I have 100 flavors. There's shops that mix inside. Or they, they have thousands of flavors. Whether I agree with it or not, it's irrelevant. I'm just telling right. you that if you're going to do a cost analysis on a proper PMTA, these are the numbers that we're talking about. And that's just testing. This is just testing. Right. That doesn't include anything else. Nothing else. Well, don't get me into clinical. You know, um, I, I, I doubt clinical is, is I, again... I don't want to. I don't want to talk too much about this because some people might get offended. I definitely think that HPHC and stability. There's no way that the FDA will look at your application if it says on it. In my opinion, if it says on there, uh, okay, Phil, Phil Busardo, on on Phil's PP tiers here, you say that the expiration date is um, January 2021. Correct? Is that what you say on your label? Yes, that's that's what I got. Okay. How did you come to that conclusion? Um, because I, I, I saw it on Facebook. in the past, and my PP tiers they don't maintain the same uh, strength and potency uh, as they once did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's funny, 
But yeah. if you look at the reality of it, is right, this is an right. an, this is a question that you need to answer. How do you come up with an expiration date if you haven't done a stability test to see what your liquid does at three, six, 12 months? Right. If you're putting a year on there, if you're putting two years, then you need a two-year stability test, which can be accelerated, by the way. They can do it in six months. They and, can do and two if years. You just just started thinking about doing a PMTA, chances are you don't have that, and that, and that alone takes a long time. Correct. Now, you can file that you're doing it, like we're doing for okay. some companies. We didn't have, I mean, we actually have liquids at labs that are being tested for stability now, and we have a letter from the lab that says it'll be ready January 2021, and we'll amend that application and give them, the, but we actually have protocols showing that the work has started, but okay. there's no way in the time frame to get a stability test, especially with COVID, which a lot of the labs laid off uh, work as well too, which we've explained that into, the, into some of the clients. But the HVAC testing as well, I think it's important. I don't personally think that we should do seven reps, three batches, one regime. I don't personally think that. Now, what if Philip Morris has done that? What if Jewel has done that? What if Hughes has done that? What if Avail has done that? They've already submitted a PMTA. And we come right behind and say, well, we're not going to follow HPAC. It's just a question that I'm posing so, people, so, so I'm honest and everybody understands what, what I'm talking about. Let me, let me get through this really, really quick. Um, yeah, I talked about this. Your PMTA should control a well-structured summary to provide the FDA with adequate understanding of the data and information in the PMTA, including quantitative um, aspects of the data. FDA recommends that you include a description of the operation, blah, 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 health risks, toxicological. See, it even says inside there, this is in the, in, in the summary of the guidelines, Toxilog toxicological testing outcomes of the product. The product's effects on tobacco use behavior among current users. The product's effect on tobacco initiation, blah, blah, blah. It's clear in the guidelines, in my opinion, that some minimum thresholds have to, have to be met. What's the timeline? Of course, you submit a PMTA by the deadline, which is September 9th, 2020. Um, if your application is expected, uh, accepted, you will get a letter. Right? We've seen some companies already announce that they have gone through phase one and that the FDA has accepted. We saw that S'more, the first hardware company uh, to get accepted for, um, for their PMTA. We've seen Avail, we've seen Views, we've seen um, Jewel, we've seen um, Prism. I I'm never, I'm not quite, I think it's a gas station line of e-liquid. But anyway, we've seen some companies that have filed open vapor and closed vapor products. Um, Phase two would be notification of filing. I think something that a lot of people are not talking about here, they're talking about acceptance and review. They forget about that middle step, which is the filing, which can be a rejection. Even if your application has been accepted, it can be rejected at phase two, okay? They can just reject the filing and reject your entire application. Then we move into phase three, which is the review. And then of course the action that the FDA is gonna take, if they're gonna grant you market authorization to be on the market, or they're gonna say no, or you have inadequate data and they're gonna ask for more data, which is something that we're hoping as well too. At any given time here, acceptance, you can continue to sell your product in the US legally until you hear back from the FDA. In my humble opinion, I'm not an attorney, I think if you submit a PMTA, you can continue to sell your product until you hear acceptance or rejection. That's just my opinion. I just don't think that the FDA is going to do first, first three months, send you something, uh, or they're going to review thousands of applications that are going in within the first three months to reject you, reject you uh, outright. All right. Yeah, go ahead. So you, you said um, you said that there's the cutoff date to, to get the PMTAs in, but is that true? I mean, can't you file a PMTA at any time? Yes, but you can't sell it on the market. This cutoff date is for products that were on the market prior to August okay. 8th of 2016. Again, nobody talks about this. Right, okay. Everybody talks about PMTAs, but they don't understand what the actual definition is. You can file a PMTA tomorrow, a year from now, right? two years from now, but you can't sell it in the United States. Prime example, the, I'm going to take a call in just a second, 973 SE. Prime example, my next slide. This product was never sold in the United States and it was granted, it was granted a pre-market tobacco application. Right. Okay. Brilliant. You know why? Because they launched it in other countries. They launched it in Japan. They launched it in Korea. They got a bunch of data from there that said, oh yeah, we're going to go to Japan where there's no, you know, nicotine liquid. We're going to launch this product and we're going to show that 10% of smokers transition to this. Brilliant. I mean, I wish I had their money, honestly, because I've done the same thing, but brilliant. Okay. And when you want to talk about PMTA, 
listen, just go to the FDA. Their cover sheet is right there. This is the application for Marlboro heat sticks, smooth methyl heat sticks, the system, and the menthol heat sticks. Look at this. This is just the cover sheet. This is not the PMTA field. It's 122 pages of them telling them what they've included in their PMTA. I think it's about 150,000 pages was their PMTA. Okay, this is the actual summary of what they've included. If you look through this, it's, I mean, there's no way we can meet this threshold. Of course, this is, you know, obviously PMI. I mean, they have tons of science. They have scientists on staff. They have scientific um, in Switzerland, you know, headquarters, and they have legal attorneys and all that. But you can go through here and see how much work just on the cover letter that they have put into their product. Not only that, you know, you can look at here. This is uh, more as... Um, presentation from global forum on nicotine how much science they have invested in this product it's been developed for like the last 10 15 years right they spent a lot of money developing this product because they know that the future is going to go into you know less harmful alternative products and they want to corner the market they've invested billions into the iquos you can see here all the work that they've done and they also understand the importance of fda approval this is a transcript from a shareholder meeting of the of uh, of the shareholders of PMI back in 2016, where it says, as you know, the FDA gave guidance that they may take X amount of days. That's talking about getting a modified risk um, designation. But what we believe more within the 2017 reel is the product authorization for the U.S. market will come without claim. So they knew before they even filed that we believe that we're going to get a PMTA in America. And irrespective of the approval in the United States, the FDA approval obviously helps the credibility international, but it doesn't apply for Japan. So what they're saying here is that if we get an FDA uh, PMTA, then you know, we can use this and say, hey, look, even the FDA said that we're less harmful than cigarettes. We can use this internationally to further our brand. And, and so, <laughs> what, are, what are the odds of PMI after doing all that work and spending all that money, right? Looking at other PMT applications, uh, not seeing the level that they've done, uh, watching potentially uh, those PMTA or you know watching those be accepted, potentially watching them be approved, and PMI turning around and suing the FDA because they didn't do everything that PMI did. And PMI um, has the I, money to do that. As long as we meet the minimum statutory requirements of the PMTA, the FDA does have some discretion. Okay. Okay. So we'll talk about that in a little bit, in a, in a little bit more more detail. But Bill is like going crazy on here. Um, let me get this phone call real quick. They've been waiting very, very patiently. Just to yeah, nine seven three. Hey, this is John from New Jersey. How you doing? Hey, John. What's up, buddy? I'm sorry about your state, man. So first, I just want to <laughs> sorry. We we got. It. Um, so two things. Number one, uh, you said Prism. So Prism is actually just the same stuff that Avail submitted, oh. except we're under another brand. Gotcha. Um, and they did that because they realized that people nationally are not going to buy e-liquid from a retail competitor. Gotcha. So they also submitted it under Prism, and it's essentially the same stuff. Gotcha. Different names for the same flavors. Yeah. Um, no wonder I didn't know clarify it. that. But <laughs> so the other thing that's um, th this is a hypothetical question, and I doubt you have the answer, but this is something that I often think about: is say there's an uh, an open system tank, right? Yeah. And the FDA says oh, and th that that company some company in Shenzhen say you will tries to put their valerian tank through yeah right what how how is that even possible right it, i mean it has a 510 pin because it's supposed to be interchangeable you can fire it at different watts depending on what you screw it onto the e-liquid that you put into that is almost unknowable to ul correct and you can't like say ul was making the most good faith attempt to get through this process right correct they weren't trying to cheat they were ready to spend all the money in the world how do you even put in a good faith application for something that doesn't come as a complete package phil that's, what, what have i said I don't, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah i get you phil what have i said multiple times about 510 that no, no 510s will get through 
I, I just don't see it going through. I really don't. I, I agree with you. I just don't see an open system going through because what would UL require to do would be to test their product with every available marketed e-liquid that's on the market today and then report on how their product is reacting with the open source system software, basically the liquid that they're putting in the tank, which is virtually impossible. And like you said, you know, we're trying, we're doing a good faith effort as well too. And again, we're filing PMTAs next week, but I don't have have full confidence in this unless the FDA determines and gives an open market authorization to liquid okay and if liquid is is deemed appropriate then it's gonna have to have devices that go along with it and the FDA just simply says hey look you don't have to follow PMTA a or B yeah you can have market authorization for your product but it needs to be uh, it needs to comply it needs to be used with the products that we have authorized to be on the market which is means open liquids that could be available sold for the next year or that have been granted market authorization. Yeah, but does that re work in reverse? Wouldn't it also mean that all that open liquid has to be tested with all the stuff that's a take Correct. A 510 pin or Correct. an open system vaporizer and then say, okay, these are the, this is sort of the universe oh, yeah. of stuff that's acceptable. Now e-liquid companies come back and test it with this available yes. hardware. I agree with you I mean, partially I there. Yes. The ecosystem. Yeah, I agree yeah. with you partially. The only thing that you can do is when you're doing HPHC testing, a set a standard and say my liquid, my liquid is is uh, designed to be work to be vaporized uh, with a point four between a point four ohm coil and a point eight ohm coil between fifteen and seventeen watts, right? And this is how we tested it in the market as well too. So this is what you can do in an open market, you know, open e-liquid application with the FDA. But again, like you said, I again, I understand what I'm with you on this. I'm not again. I'm telling you that it's going to be very, very hard for any open vapor system unless the closed systems have proved such a huge problem in America because of the youth use, where the FDA says we're not allowing closed systems at all. We're only allowing opening systems based on our discretion. Meaning adults are using these products and kids are not using them. That could happen as well too, John. Let me ask you one more question. Sure. Um, now we're getting away from now we're getting away from good faith, right? Yeah. So for as long as there's been head shops, there's been glass bombs. Yes. Marijuana has been federally illegal in this country for decades. Yes. Every bong that gets sold gets sold under the guise that it's for tobacco. Purposes, tobacco. Yes. Right. So who, who can tell me that one of your Anakin Aries tanks can't be used to vaporize CBD? Yes. Thank you. If it thank, doesn't deliver nicotine. Thank you for the plug. You're absolutely right. In fact, at one point, I was in China, and I told Phil, all I have to do is go to these Chinese manufacturers and say, you need to print on that box not to be used with nicotine. And they're done. There's nothing that they can do. The problem, though, occurs... Okay. The problem occurs when you take that product and you put it and you sell it with a nicotine product. You understand what I'm saying? So if you're selling vapor products with nicotine in your store and the FDA comes in, they're going to say, well, look, this is reasonably expected that you're going to sell this product and you're going to put a nicotine, a tobacco product in it, then it's a tobacco product. Because most of the places that sell pipes don't actually sell weed. They just sell the pipes. You get what right. I'm saying, but it's different but, but, for us. But but you could reasonably you could re reasonably bring in every piece of hardware from Shenzhen that was labeled absolutely for CBD use only. If you had absolutely if you had one brand a PMTA accepted if that ever happens or approved yeah. e-liquid. I I totally agree. I totally agree. And you're going to okay. see that. You can, I, I mean, you're going to see. Sure I wasn't crazy. No, you're not crazy at all. You're going to see that happening. There's going to be people out there that, and companies that are going to skirt and try to find ways to get around this. It's, it happens. It's essentially a black market that's being created, but that happens all the time. It's not. We're not new to this. We're going to find. We saw it in Europe. Look at Europe, how we adjusted, right? With the short fields and the long fields and putting plugs in the tanks to make them two mil and then you remove the plug to make it four mil and so on. And so on. There's ways to adjust it. We'll be able. We'll be fine. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be as easy, but we'll be right. fine. I agree with you. I hope I answered Thank as you. much as I possibly could, John. Yeah, my name is not really John. We partied in Vegas last. I didn't want to say my name because I, I dropped. I know who you are, man. I was just not trying to give, to give you okay. away, man. I know who you are. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Good luck, brother. So he Absolutely. actually uh, uh, kind of covered a question that I had. We so partied hard in Vegas. That's what he yeah. <laughs> had a good time. Um, according to the, uh, the Tobacco Control Act, so based on what you said, 
CBD is not covered. No. Um, zero nick is not covered. Mm, gray area. Oh, yeah, but how can it be a gray area? If it's derived or made from tobacco. It clearly says it. It clearly says it in the... In the, in the then, then zero nick is not covered. I, I agree with you. Okay. I agree with you. But if you make a product in zero, three, four, and six, or zero... This is how tired I am. If you make a product in zero, three, six, twelve, 12, yeah. then you have to include that zero milligram product in your PMTA because it's part of the brand lineup. Oh, I see what you're saying, but I mean, it could still be sold, though. <laughs> As Cuomo would say, technically, yes, but well, so, so what? what? <laughs> All right, let me finish. I got, I got a few more slides. Well, and wait, but wouldn't that also call uh, cover synthetic, Nick? Right? So ba basically, yes. what, we, what I heard from the Tobacco Control Act, CBD is not covered. Yes. Zero Nick is not covered. Yes. Um, and, and fake Nick is not covered. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right, let me finish. This. I can't believe I've gone an hour and a half. My 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 mouth's so dry, like I smoked weed that one time in Vegas. And it, have a sip of something. Man. <laughs> I will. Uh, all right, let me get. I, I've lost my um. I've lost my uh, my slides. Okay, I just want to get through this really quick. Just three slides left. So what's next? All right, what's next on behalf of the open vapor system? Oop, I didn't even hit the uh, the button. Here we go. What's <laughs> next uh, on behalf of the open uh, uh, system vapor industry? Keller and Heckman filed a citizen petition with the FDA. And HHS requested an extension of the pre-market tobacco product application due to the ongoing impact of COVID. If you haven't seen this, um, you know, one of the reasons why we're, we're losing is one of these. And I'm going to show you. This is the actual transcript. Uh, no, that's not it. Sorry. Let me close that. Let me close that. Here it is. This is the petition that was filed by Azim uh, yesterday. Uh, I'm on this. A few TSFA members are on this. We've expressed our opinions uh, as an open vapor industry, you know, we don't sell pods and stuff like that, closed systems, high nick stuff. We've expressed the difficulty that we have with the COVID and how difficult it has been for us to go through the PMTA application and other reasons as well, too. So that's one thing that's happening right now. Uh, this was submitted yesterday. Uh, if you go down and see this, this is on Twitter, by the way. You can see all the declarations. Here's the names. Of course, you know, it's got my Jimmy Dimitri Griffiers because that's my official name. Uh, but you're going to see, you can read the actual declarations and what businesses have gone through because of COVID and other issues that they've had. Financial issues, employee issues, traveling issues, lab issues, everything is explained into this. That's one thing that we're doing. And the other thing that, that, that happened today was the USVA filed uh, a letter to Azar and the FDA Again, stating the same things, the issues that they have, and they also offered a solution, right? The solution is that based on the law, the FDA can use discretion on these applications, especially if they see that these products are not being used by kids, meaning the open vapor system big tanks are not being used by kids. So they, can, they don't necessarily have to go through these stringent regulations to approve the product. Uh, and that's something that the United States Vaping Association uh, 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 answered as well, too. Uh, so... It, it leads me to, to this, right? It leads me to this. Here are the billion, and I put lives there because there are billions of lives at stake here, but it's actually a billion-dollar question as well, too. You know, will the FDA enforce and prioritize? Uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, if we look, again, these are questions that I'm asked on a daily basis. If you look at the history of the FDA, uh, no. They really haven't enforced with, with maybe, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 warning letters that they sent. Uh, is that enforcement? No. I do know they've ramped up hiring people and they're going through some interchange there from some of the chatter that we've heard from people and talking to some inspectors and stuff like that. But will they enforce? I don't know. But again, what are they going to enforce, right? It's very difficult for them to close this, you know, this Medusa <laughs> The plug that I even gave you, John, this Medusa of, of, you know, businesses that have sprung up all across the United States and the ways that we import and distribute and market our products because we're not the traditional change. We're not, you don't have to have a wholesale, like, well, in some states you do, but you don't have to have a whole list, like, wholesale license to sell into Tennessee. There's no way for them to track who is bringing in vapor products to Tennessee. Um, will the FDA stop revising guidance? I don't know. They've changed this guidance three times in the last year and a half, including changing the list of HPHCs. We're crying out loud. We're a small industry. If I'm going to start testing a year ago, 
and you change my HPHC testing, then I have to go back to the lab and pay more money. You know, they have to stop that. Uh, will they? I don't know. <laughs> I, I wish I knew. These are all billion live questions. Will the FDA uh, admit that the PMTA is not appropriate path for technology products? I think this one's one of the most crucial ones. Folks, we're talking about technology here. What does technology benefit feel? Why, why is technology so important to smokers? Uh, you, as an engineer, why is technology important? What does technology, what does technology do? It, it advances. It advances. Better. Yes. <laughs> Got that correct. Um, technology is important for the safety of the consumer. Right. On this particular product, it's not tobacco rolled in a cigarette. You light it. We're done. This product is a technology product. It does not fit in the PMTA pathway simply because it freezes the market. As you saw earlier, everything prior to August 2016, done. We put the cutoff date. In four years, I mean, have you seen the cross airflow control system on the Aries? <laughs> See what I did there? I did that. Um, and that's just an example. But you know what I'm getting. That not just for that, for improvement and satisfaction of the consumer, but also the safety of the consumer. Technology advances, and the system is not set up for technology to advance. Well, so you know, so and and it's true. I, I, a very smart person told me once, you know, well, look at the automotive uh, industry, right? We, you know, we started with seat belts, and then we got anti-lock brakes, and now we have, uh, you know, uh, lane avoid, uh, lane departure avoidance. We have sonar systems that, that that stop the car automatically if they see an an impact coming forward and reverse. That's like saying that, okay, you can't have any of that anymore. We're going back to the time right before seatbelts came out. Exactly. That's what they're doing. That's exactly what they're saying. Yes, yeah. that's exactly what they're saying. And it's, it's, it, it simply doesn't fit is what I'm saying. It simply doesn't fit the product category. And the FDA at some point will have to justify using the enforcement discretion based on this fact alone. Yeah. Again, I don't hear a lot of talk about it. Oh, by the way, what I wanted to say earlier uh, on that tweet that Azim did, talking about filing that petition, he got like 40 retweets, 50, 60, or whatever. Aren't there at least 1,000 people making e-liquid that will lose their business September the 9th? I'm just asking a question. Again, I'm, I'm not trying to be just, you know, I don't want to keep punching the industry because they do a great job of punching their balls by themselves. But shouldn't this be tweeted to every politician that, you, that represents you? Take this, tweet it to your local legislators to your congressman to your senator and said look i'm a small business i'm a constituent in your business i have five employees and look at this letter what it says i'm going to be out of business in 14 days do something the fuck about it uh zero fucks i mean not zero fucks uh how about five percent fucks uh given will the administration excuse me will the fda accept and and pmta with limited data this is a very very good question if i show you uh the iquos pmta and if I show you the su sweetest match PMTA, which is a really a marvel of 20 years of science that have been accumulated from Sweden, and you, I show you the PMTAs that we're filing, and again, the PMTAs that we're filing are different levels as well too, okay? So we have some really good medium and lower tier. It doesn't make any difference to me. I think that everybody should file. I totally, I, t I, I mean, will it be accepted? I don't know. <laughs> if I knew that, I will, you know, I could save money or spend more money. You know what I'm saying? I, we don't know. The FDA didn't even grant us a, a meeting when we asked them multiple times with Azim to meet uh, based on the structure of the PMTA that we're following with the, with the coalition. But the FDA did not grant us those meetings. So nobody knows until we start filing and see what the FDA is going to do. There's no answer to that is basically what I'm saying. Will the administration step in and follow through with a promise of deregulation? I don't want to make this political, but I have to. I have to feel. 2017, Trump announced that he's going to deregulate 75% of the federal agencies that squash, squash private businesses. Yep. That's what he said. Listen, I don't care who you voted for, but if you did vote for him, that was his promise. It's on the record. Now, a very small portion of that promise has been kept, and it's been really happening more in the environmental, petrol section, <laughs> gas, oil, obviously, okay? 
But where's us? How about us? We make a product that saves people lives. I know. Where's your promise to deregulate? You know what I'm saying? If you voted for him, you should be outraged. I'm tweeting him. If you didn't vote for him, you still should be outraged. You should be tweeting politicians and find out what happened. Why are we getting the, the short end of the stick here, especially when we're offering an option for smokers? Will the FDA streamline PMTA process after receiving applications? I don't know. We were promised a streamline from Azar, right? From the Secretary of uh, Human Health Ser Services. It didn't come. Why aren't we outraged about that? Why aren't we raising? Well, we did in the letter, but uh, and also USVA did the same thing as well too. But but why aren't the consumers, the people that are selling these products, outraged about this? I don't know. I hope we do. Maybe if they receive an extraordinary amount of applications, the FDA says, well, maybe we need to take a look at this a little bit better. Maybe. Will the FDA appropriate categories for products closed versus open systems? I mean, we see that the FDA says that we need to protect the health, not only of the users, but the population as a whole. So will it look at the data and say, well, let's look at the youth data from last year. You know, what are these kids using? They're using pods versus open systems. Well, maybe we need to be a bit more stringent on pod systems, and we need to be a little bit more loose on open systems. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't have the answer to that. These are all billion-dollar questions. Will Big Tobacco set the bar on PMTA submissions? We talked about that a little bit briefly earlier, but if you look at the jewel, if you look at the views, if you look at the IQOS applications, will the FDA look at that and say, well, this is the threshold that every company has to meet in order to get a PMTA granted? If they do that, we're fucked, okay? I mean, we are totally 100% fucked. Will it end PMTA silence critics and grant state relief? Great question. Well, I mean, some of these states have put that clause in field where it says if you're granted a PMTA, you can sell the product in the state, but others haven't. Other states have banned flavor products or vapor products in general. Uh, it would take for you to reverse that law to actually go and challenge it. So even if a PMTA is granted, don't think that automatically the states are going to say, oh, okay, well, you can sell them again. It doesn't work like that. There's actually a law process that has to go to reverse that law, and that takes time as well, too, and it needs to be challenged. People need to spend money on that. Are your states prepared to do that? I don't personally think that it's going to end states from coming after these products, but it's definitely going to slow down when you have a legal product that you can go to a state hearing and say, look, the FDA has said this product is less harmful than cigarettes. Let's work together, find some you know, good legislation to keep these products away from the hands of the youth and punish those bad actors, but make sure you keep this technology available for the adult smokers in your state. It will help there, but will it stop the onslaught? No. Will it stop groups? No. And prime example is the IQOS. The IQOS was granted a PMTA and immediately... Parents versus Vape, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, Stanton Glance, came out there, excuse me, they were granted modified risk product category, immediately came out there and said the FDA shouldn't have done that. So it doesn't stop them. And Icos was smart. As soon as they were granted the PMTA field, they didn't come and dump their product into the market. They're waiting. They're going to a couple of test markets. They're getting everything set up. They're waiting for. Notice that, I, like when we go overseas, we see you know the Echoes, uh, play, uh, the the Echo stores everywhere, right? I haven't seen anything in the states yet. Very smart. They're very smart. Yeah. So what they're doing is they're waiting. There's a September 9th deadline coming. <laughs> Guess what? If vapor products start being removed from the market, that's a perfect time to launch a product that's been approved from the FDA as less harmful than cigarettes. You know what I'm saying? Plus, they're, they're still getting pressure, you know, from, from, the, uh, from the tobacco control groups. So they're just sitting back. They don't, I mean, they don't care. They don't, you know, they're looking for the opportunity to, to make the huge impact and to capture the most amount of smokers. Okay? That's yeah. what they're doing. They're very, very smart. The last question, you know, this is kind of, a, you know, like a little jab so if you're watching jerome adams how many kids vaping are acceptable to balance half a million adult smokers uh, smoker deaths every year all right give me a scale give me a scale. how many is 10 kids started to vape okay as long as we can prevent 20 adults from dying is there a balance there we don't have that balance and part of that is one of your steps in the pmta you need to show that kids are not using this product so what is that acceptable scale? And why is there a scale on a product that's almost harmless like vaping? Why would you remove that option from adults 
because a few shitheads, you know, wanted to pick up vaping. Which, by the way, if you look at the youth statistics from last year that just came out a couple of days ago, I haven't analyzed the whole thing, but I've gone through a little bit, shows that smoking in kids, all-time low, all-time low, all-time low, which immediately debunks the gateway myth. Kids are not transitioning from vapor products to... Why do I have to keep putting the wrong... Should have just removed that one. All right? So that debunks that myth. Okay, there is no gateway. And it also debunks the fact that, listen... If kids are picking up vaping, that means they're not picking up smoking. That, in turn, as a population as a whole, is good. It's not bad. If you accept that it's a form of harm reduction and it's less harmful than cigarettes. All right, my last slide here, and I'm going to get to your questions. Nope. <laughs> Try again. Take two. There you go. What should we do doing until uh, September uh, the 9th? Uh, I put this picture over here, which, in my opinion, this should be the face of vaping, okay? Because people like her need vapor products. You need to be contacting your legislators, folks. If you're in any capacity involved in this industry and you want to advocate and fight for it, whether you manufacture, distribute, sell, use the product, or you just care about smokers, you need to be contacting your legislators. Take that letter that we submitted. Show this to your legislators. And say, look what the FDA is doing. You know, you believe in small business. You believe in helping people quit smoking. This is what we're doing, and the FDA is taking it away from us. The best thing that you can be doing right now, just the other day I had a company contact me. I'm not going to tell you who. Pod System, wanting to follow PMTA. Two days, two days ago. I got a 16-day deadline, and then we're going to contact me. To, to, I said, listen, the best <laughs> thing that you can do is, you know, take a couple, you know, $20,000 and go donate it to your local politician and stay away from the PMTA. First of all, there's no way that anybody would take you. Uh, there's no way that we can complete the work in, in 16 days. So what you should be doing right now is reaching out to your local legislators. And then past that date, what are we doing September the 10th? Everything that we've been doing up to now. Nothing is going to change and nothing should change. You should continue to sell products. You should continue to use products. You should continue to stock your shelves. You should continue to help smokers quit. You need to continue to make these products available for the adults that have quit smoking using your product. At your store, you have that responsibility. And in my opinion, as liberty, if you want to call that, you have the right to disobey a law that is unfair and unjust because that's exactly what this PMTA process is for the independent vapor industry. That's what I had. I hope Very people, well I, hope that, I hope it was helpful to go through. Very well done, my friend. Very impressive. Let me uh, get some questions. I dread, I dread to look at these questions. Maybe I've answered some of them, though. Boy, Bill's got a whole line. Dan Morrow, talk about how all existing tobacco products were grandfathered in pre-PMTA. I did talk about that. I showed that. What happened to February 2007? Why that date? Uh, because it was part of the negotiation agreement between tobacco and between 2007 and 2009, there was really no, the finalized version of the Tobacco Control Act happened in February 2007. That's when everybody shook hands in the back room, blew each other. Matt Myers got money. MSA got money. Tobacco companies got grant. That's when the big party happened was February of 2007. So, the law says that since we came to the agreement there, by the time we pass this bill, the grandfather date is set at that. It doesn't make any difference to tobacco companies. The tobacco companies have their products in the market anyway. They're all going to be grandfathered in. No competition, so it didn't really make... It wasn't, it's not a technology product. It's not like we're going to drop, you know, the new donut cigarette the next, like we do, right? The next donut flavor. So that's why that debt was cho chosen. Um, I saw on Vaping with Vic... <laughs> That Public Health England, who brought the 95 Safer Delight, is being dissolved. Is that a world attack on vaping? No, it has to do with COVID, and unfortunately, it's taking the ball. And I don't, I'm not necessarily understand how the, the dissolve is going to happen. I'm not 100% sure. But the data that the Public Health England has provided for the last four years since that first RCP report came out, Nicotine Without Smoke, is data. It's there. We can use it whether Public Health uh, England is going to be there or not. And hopefully, what new entity they're going to create will continue to support harm reduction in the UK. If a product is approved, can other companies use that approval in part or whole to get their product approved? Yes. You can use that approval as saying that your product is very similar to them and uh, that should help with your application. 
However, part of the statutory requirement of a PMTA is product-specific data, okay? Which you can bridge. Like within your company, you can bridge a lot of information that you're collecting, but you still have to have product-specific because guess what? Phil's PP tiers might be used by kids, but Dimitri's delicious uh, cool, um, uh, <laughs> I'm so tired, uh, but Dimitri's delicious unsalted cool citrus is not being used by kids. It's only used by very good looking, handsome and good looking women. <laughs> That's right. So you need to be able to provide that data along with the testing that you're doing, toxicological data, HPHCs, emissions, stability that you do on your product specific to submit to that FDA. And that's where the main cost is. Look, literature data, there's tons of it out there for vaping. In our PMTAs, we're submitting the Cardinal Cam, which is a huge, and a lot of people are using that as well too. Huge peer review. And there's more coming out. We've seen some studies come out just in the last couple of months. that are gonna, They're going to support our argument that vaping is better than smoking. But you also have to provide product specific data. Hey, hey, go back to that photo of your, go back to the other camera. See that drip tip? Yeah, yeah what, what the hell was that? It looked like a telescope, <laughs> telescopic drip tip on that thing. What is that? I, I found this the other day. So this is <laughs> bigger than the actual modern tank itself. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's, uh, it's a Vapor yeah. Giant. Uh, it, I don't know if you remember that big 26650 Vapor Giant. They yes. got like 2012. That was the drip tip. That, that was the drip tip. It. Yes. Okay. And yep. you know what? Looks terrific. I dig it. <laughs> now, is that a component? It's gray area. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. All right. I'm going through your questions here. Um, the phone line is going to be open for like eight more minutes. If you have any questions and you want to call in, call in now. Even if you hear the British lady, you can stay on hold even after the two hours are up. So um, if you want to talk to us or have a specific question, please call 215-383-5752. Um, do, do you think there's any coincidence between uh, all of these states banning flavors and this PMTA deadline seem, seeming to happen right around the same time frame? No, I think that, I mean, what we saw in California today, I mean, we're expecting it, I'll be honest. I, 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 who didn't see this coming? They started counting the county, city to city, and then eventually they put it in a statewide ban. Uh, what the states are doing is because of losing revenue, period. It has nothing to do with the PMTA. Now, if they were banning, uh, like, tobacco pods, Altria would step in. We saw that happen in Montana, right? But if they're not banning tobacco pods, if they're not banning, you know, stuff. What's a little bit interesting in California, they're banning menthol cigarettes as well, too. And there's not a big uproar about that so far. And it will be challenged at some point. But um, the states are doing this simply because they're losing revenue. Has nothing to do with health. Has nothing to do with COVID. Has nothing to do with the volley. All those are just the tools they're using to push this through, uh, at a, you know, at a, during a crisis and a pandemic to, to protect the revenues. That's all it is. Okay, how about this question? The teen vaping epidemic. Yeah. Could the teen vaping epidemic be a conspiracy to keep vaping products off the market while ICOS gets through? No. No? No. Kids are using these products. There's no doubt about it. I, I, there's, no doubt, there's no doubt in my mind. Small, stealthy devices hurt our industry. Products like Juul, Puff Bar, stuff like that hurt our industry. Not because they're bad. They're just stealthy. They're very small. They're easy to conceal. And there's no smell. Oh, I, so, I agree. So okay. kids so transition maybe, to because kids are smart. Reword that. Uh, yeah, kids are definitely using it. But do, but do you think that perhaps it's being blown out of proportion? Oh, yeah. yeah, of course, of course. Of course. Okay. Yes. No doubt. No doubt. I, they're using that. We saw it with the right. youth study that came out. That's a twelve point seven. Blah, blah, blah. The point is, this product is less harmful than cigarettes. So my point is, what's the big deal? You know, the kids are doing meth and coke and you know having unprotected DP sex. You know. And, and uh, what, about all, yeah. what about all of the studies and charts? And we should kind of talk about this on one of these shows coming up that I've seen that just prove the ICOS is not as um, risk-reduced as vaping products. Yes. So we're using that argument in our PMTA. We're telling the FDA, look, you approved the ICOS, and we're giving you literature and data that shows that our product is actually less harmful than even ICOS. So if you right. said that ICOS is less harmful than cigarettes, we're telling you that our product is less harmful than cigarettes and ICOS. So we're using that argument. Again, if I show you the chart and I show it to the vapors that are watching the show, who's going to see it? 
people that already know that. Like, what we needed is a PR campaign that says, hey, look at this data on, you know, CNN at 7 o'clock or Fox News. I'll balance it out for you fucking people that leave comments. Like, I'm trying to pick whatever. Whatever. Like, on, like, on fucking TLC during Pawn Stars, 30-second commercial that came out and said, by the way, you know, look at this data over here. Vaping is better than smoking. Also, vaping is better than, than, than Icos. You know, again, it's a, it's a funding thing. It's a revenue. It's a dollar thing. But, but isn't that a lawsuit waiting to happen? I mean, if you prove that vaping is, is, is safer than Icos, yet Icos gets a PMTA and vaping products do not, I mean, isn't that a lawsuit? No, because this federal statute based on the Tobacco Control Act says, yeah, we'd love to have less harmful products on the market. Prove it. Prove it. Yeah, okay. Prove it through the PMTA. I'm going to okay. get to your calls in just a second. Just, uh, just hold on. Even if you hear the, the, the show ending, just hold on. Let me get to these questions, and I'm going to get to your calls. 423, that's Chattanooga, too. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to talk to you in just a second. Uh, Big Wheel Dog 82. What's up, Big Wheel? So the FDA expects the industry to explain all human behavior. If it was that easy, we wouldn't need to be in the current situation. Absolutely right. But that answers the question even from Phil, because, yes, based on the PMTA, you do have to explain how Consumers behave with your product, not only smokers. I, I stress that. I stress that. You need to prove that non-users of the product are not initiating use. You also have to prove that kids are not initiating use, which is very rare in, if there's no other center in the FDA that requires that. For the product. So, for example, if I wanted to put sausage, <laughs> feel sausage, Feels homemade sausage on the market. Delicious, by the way. Again, very delicious. 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 A little salty, yeah. but delicious. Plump and meaty, too. Right. I wouldn't have to prove to get FDA approval to sell this food product on the market on how Phil sausage would affect the population as a whole. You understand what I'm saying? It's just an example, trying to give you just kind of a relative idea of why it's unfair and unjust for, for our category because we're simply deemed a tobacco product. FDA just deemed us a tobacco product, so you're fucked. I got a new soundboard. Did I tell you that? You know, you, I remember when I, I once said that uh, that Icos. Uh, I thought it was it was. I thought they were going to just give the device away in favor of selling the stuff. They will. They will. Right? Do you, Do you really think so, or do you think they'll they'll keep the 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 price of entry high to keep it away from the kids? No. So what they're doing is. Uh, they'll they'll have it on the market at a regular price. Then they'll run specials because they have a database of smokers. I still get Marlboro emails, right? So then what they do is they they come they come out and they say, oh, listen, you're a Marlboro user, you know, you can get the device for five euros today. You know, what, this is what they do in Europe, right? So they run these specials all through year round, depending on the time, if it's close to January and stuff like that. And so they'll have specials for smokers. Absolutely. Ninety seconds. Ignore ignore that lady. Everybody that's on hold, ignore that lady. Yeah, but that's also that's also targeted um, to smokers, people that they know are of age. Yes, yes, they, yes. Well, the, the law may, they don't always adhere to that. Okay, I caught them in Atlanta. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, they don't always hear. But based on the Tobacco Control Act, yes. Starting 2011, you cannot advertise, minimum advertisement. It has to be a certain demographic, certain a time on TV, certain publications, certain events, and stuff like that. There's laws in place for that. Uh, Mowgli Vapes. Does FDA's Inspections, Compliance, Enforcement, and Criminal Investigation Division actually kick indoors and arrest people? Um, I have not seen it in, in any tobacco case. Ogly, if that answers, they can. Will they? I, I, I highly doubt it. I highly doubt it. Uh, it would be fun though. <laughs> can you imagine <laughs> sitting over there down at Fields, you know, chilling in his room, and fucking FDA just bust down the door? Oh, you give away a smoker's kid on the smoker show. We saw you. Like a surrounded, you know, fucking helicopter. That would get us views. That, that would be views on great. That. Should yep. go live. Um. Can you, uh, a question from Vapor Man on Paris. Can you vape 12 milligram e juice in a single coil? Absolutely. That's all we will vape it on. It's the best to vape it on. Here you save a lot of juice. Single coil. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Brian Kim, what type of enforcement do you think the FDA will take post 8 9 and do you suspect it will be swift and immediately? Immediate. So I think I answered that question. I don't know. I definitely don't think it's going to be swift and immediate. 
I, I just can't see how logistically during COVID it's possible. Okay, I, I just, I don't think. I don't think it's going to be swift and immediate. If it is, it's going to be to one big company. Um, maybe to make an example of like a puff bar or something, you know, some of these companies that they've had complaints on for kids and stuff like that. Maybe you see something like that. But again, there's a process for them. They can't just bust in the door. I mean, they could, but they have to send you a letter first and then you have to prove why your product is continuing to be sold. And if you can't prove that, then they, you know, it has, it has to go through the process. That's what I'm saying. So I don't think it's going to be. Sergio Gonzalez, much appreciated for the $50 super chat, man. I, was, I put a lot of work in this, so I appreciate your super chat. I really do. Uh, thank you so much, Sergio. You're always really nice to us, and, uh, and we appreciate it. Sergio, I'm, I'm even going to uh, give Dimitri 51% of that uh, dollar amount. <laughs> as soon as I figure out where it goes, he gets it. Thanks, buddy. Um, Pico Lecter, prior to September 9th, PMTA deadline is the unsalted line number one bestseller, still the famous watermelon peach. Please. <laughs> Of course it is. Oh my God. <laughs> Listen, even though, even though he, sh I, I've been very quiet. Dimitri's done such a fantastic job. I'm so in awe with the knowledge he is, uh, he is imparting on us tonight that I have not mentioned that uh, the watermelon peach is the number one best selling flavor in the unsalted line. I even allowed him to plug his flavor without saying that the watermelon peach is the number one flavor, number one best selling flavor in the unsalted line. But since you brought it up, now you know. And I don't want you to panic, but you can get it before September the 9th at RockyTopVapor.com. Go, go order right now. Now. Order like 20 bottles of each. <laughs> no, I, I hate when companies do that. Like, ah, go out there and buy and stock up. But just, I mean, do it. Do it for us. Uh, Rom Ram Disc. Rob, Rob Ram Disc. That sounds like a great name for the DP show, by the way. I got caught buying an unapproved PMTA cigarette product from Canada or China. How qualified as an illegal contraband and shipping in, into the United States will I be charged with a federal crime? No. Go back, look at the episode, the first or second slide that I put up. That's why I put it up there. If I'm going to order something from China that goes directly to the consumer, there's nothing we can do about it, honestly. And it happens all the time with contraband today. Okay, so we're talking about a device that's in a package that comes from China. They're not going to do anything to you. Absolutely nothing. Chuck Meister, do you think products were grandfathered in because there was no way in hell they would get passed any other way? Um, no, I think it was just the, I think it was smart. I think that negotiation came from tobacco companies, Chuck Meister. They said, okay, get off our back. We're not going to put any new products on the market, but let us grandfather all the products that we have on the market now. So I don't think it was like something deliberate. Keep in mind that when this was being negotiated, there was no vapor products on the market, or at least as we know it today. Okay, It was new technology that just came out 2007, 2008. The negotiations were taking part in the last 10 days. I mean, 10 years. So no, I don't think it was some conspiracy. All right, let me get these phones. 423, Chattanooga, Tennessee. 423. Hey, how you doing? Uh, first off, first check with you guys today for the industry and uh, all the information you get that is really and really uh, so very. Thank you. And I also feel also I'm the guy that uh, emailed you there, at 679 that uh, had a shirt belt war against you the other day with my shirt. So, uh, I just want to uh, touch on the base for the, the kids' racing thing. It, it doesn't make any sense to me that there's a politician for people are so foolish that they think these anti-vaping ads, things like that, make kids want to stop. If anything, that just makes them want to try it out. It makes them more curious. And it's, it just, it amazes me to the point of just, you know, being speechless that are they that out of touch? I mean, it makes me want to go buy new products because I think yeah. I'm missing something, you know, watching these shows and things. So what they need to do is, is, uh, is, is say, this is not, this is a boring life-saving device to keep people from smoking, help people stop smoking. There's nothing fun about it. There's nothing cool about it. You know, it's just, yeah. this is this is good to help adults stop smoking. You know, with the monotone people, which they kids would be like, well, screw that. That don't seem fun at all, you know? And, yeah. and it's, it's just like we're taking the opposite approach of what would actually work. To, to help kids be not interested in vape products instead of going on this big long 
million dollar ad campaign that just brings it to the forefront and, and makes them curious and want to try it. It just amazes me how uh, uneducated that, that these politicians and, and you know federal agencies are about that sort of thing. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to put you on hold. I'm going to answer your question. You're absolutely 110% right, and I'm going to explain to you why, and I'm going to explain to you why there's an issue to combat that, okay? Thanks for your call. I got a little uh, static okay. coming from the back. So um, number one, they know we can't w compete. So they're free rolling. They get out there and they do this because they know that we don't have the PR power to compete with him on an even playing field, okay? Number two, I'm going to tell you the biggest problem. A PMTA does not give you the authority to say your product is less harmful than cigarettes. There's another step called the modified um, tobacco risk tobacco product category, meaning that you have to go through a whole new committee with your PMTA and tell that committee to give you the authorization to actually make a claim that your product is less harmful than cigarettes as well, too. So not only now are we faced with a PMTA, which PMTA would be good. You got authorization. The FDA is basically saying that you can sell your product. And if they give you authorization, it automatically assumes that your product is less harmful because that's the only way that you can get a PMTA. But guess what? We still can't say it until we get an MRTP, Modified Risk Tobacco Product Classification. If you get that, then you can put on your product, this product can be less harmful than cigarettes. Until then, you can't. So now we got two knives, basically. PR, we can't compete. And number two, we have to go through this whole process. IQOS just got MRTP now. They filed their, uh, uh, their PMTA in 2017, and they got MRTP three years later. And they didn't exactly get what they wanted to put on the box language-wise, but they still got that this is better than cigarettes. So that gives them a huge advantage on the market, and it also gives them a huge advantage that kids probably won't pick up on IQOS either. And we have that disadvantage as well. Uh, Johnny034 with a 25 bucks. I'm trying to get a public service announcement going here. Let's go, people. Please donate. I spoke with you on Twitter the other day. This has to get done. I can't afford this. Johnny, listen, I appreciate your passion, and I hope you didn't take me the wrong way on Twitter. Um... I appreciate your passion. It takes millions of dollars to do to combat what they're spending. Millions of dollars. Unfortunately, this industry is drained at this point. It's very impossible. We had the opportunity to do it two and a half years ago. Just wait for the book to come out where me and Phil are going to talk about it, and it just didn't happen. So I I, I really appreciate what you what you're doing. Uh, you told me let's get some money to Casa. I have I have personally with Phil raised over $150,000 for Casal over the last seven years. I can document it for you if you want. I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back, but when you tweet somebody, hey, let's get this thing going, it's not like we haven't been doing anything for the last seven years. You know, It's impossible without PR to reach your average consumer to be able to raise that kind of money. You can't do it. People don't understand it. And not, I'm, not you, I'm just saying in general, people don't understand. But we appreciate the super chat as well, too. Thank you. Uh, all right, let me get this other phone call. 804. 804, you're on the air. Hello, Phil. Hello, Jimmy. How y'all doing? Great. How are you? What's Hello. your name? All right. This is Robbie. Call him from Virginia. Hey, Robbie. What's up? Oh, uh, not much. I just want to say thank you all for everything that y'all do. And um, I know that we're all sitting here hoping and praying for the best for all this to go through. But I do have some family members that work at Philip Morris here in Virginia. Yes. And they put out some surveys like every month. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of funny that I find out that their most money makers are the electronic devices that they're putting out now more than the cigarettes are. Yeah. And I find it kind of hard. How can somebody, you know, try to stop everything from that happening? But yet that's like the biggest seller that they make. And if they, learn, if they were to lose that, there will be employees that lose their job. There's no doubt they're that active, yeah, so I agree. There's no doubt that Philip Morris knows they're going to go through the approval. They're going to get approved. Okay, they know. But also at the same time, yeah. But also at the same time, um, when a veil came into Richmond, I remember when he came in. Um, that was one of the biggest uh, vape shops around yeah. the Virginia area. Well, now, like I said, with family members and friends that work there, they bought out all the veils in the state of Virginia, and it's under Philip Morris now. Yeah, I heard that that deal and didn't go through. And I found that kind of odd. I, 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 heard I that, found that kind of... I heard that deal didn't go through, by the way. I, I, <laughs> that they dropped the veil. Oh, well, 
Uh, I, I mean, I went, I went in there and I talked to a buddy of mine that works in one, and his paychecks are signed by a Philip Morris paycheck stub. Yeah, it could be true. So I, 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 I kind of find some things funny, but also the latest news that I heard, somebody mentioned uh, through one of the chats yesterday that R.J. Reynolds bought out or was going to help and buy out Vape Wild and supposedly got it, and then they turned tail tucked and just dropped the ball and just shut them all out at one time. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to tell you what, I, was, yeah, I, was I, kinda, I, just, I just can't take Facebook business announcements and Facebook attorneys at word. I can only go based on facts. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the facts that yeah. I have is that yeah. if Philip Morris does still have stake in a veil, they don't care what happens to vapor products. All the avail stores will be turned into IQO store overnight. Yeah. You understand? Because they have market yeah. authorization. So for them to buy a veil and, and eliminate vapor products completely is totally fine with them. They're eliminating the competition basically and yeah. only cost them a few million dollars. Right? So there's a thinking yeah. behind them buying a chain of 120 stores. They don't want to sell, you know, grandma's delicious banana pudding. That's not what PMI wants to sell. They want yeah. to sell iQuos. This is where they've invested millions. Yeah. So for them to do that, it's very easy and to just to sell one product in these stores, just like we see in Europe. Yeah, and, and one thing, I'm still kind of old school on a lot of laws, and, you know, we've gone through a lot here, and I know that, you know, you got to be 21 and older to go into a vape store. I understand that. They passed this law. Okay, no problem. Kids here, I know that I have some family members on police enforcement laws and stuff around here. If a, if a teen gets caught with one of these, they can get a warning if they get caught a second time, they can get a ticket or a fine, which goes to their parents. It's not going to go to them because yeah. they're going to figure out somebody else got it, but the parents have to pay for this situation. Yeah. And a third time you can be, I mean, penalized really big yeah. on this. And I still keep trying to understand, you know, FDA and all them kept putting all these regulations. You're 21 now. Yeah. Why do they keep coming after us when they've already set the law saying that, Hey, if y'all do 21, <laughs> There shouldn't be no more problems. How many times has Phil asked that question? And I still can't answer it. I mean, I wish I could. I wish I could yeah. answer you, Robbie. Right. I agree with you, buddy. We're old school I, as well, too. How about I we whip his saying. ass? How about we whip that kid's ass? Because that's what I, when my mom caught me smoking, did she whip my ass? I tell you that. I still remember with yeah. a flip flop, not a not one of those cheap flip flops, the heavy duty, expensive. Like she whipped my ass. It was red like like a monkey's ass. And, and that's a problem. That's a problem yes, with today's is. society, right? And I, I've said this so many times. We we love the word blame. We hate the word responsibility, right? So we, we have yeah. the law in place. Yeah. We have T21 in place. Enforce the law. Enforce the law. Enforce the goddamn law, yeah. okay? Do whatever it takes. Go after the kids. Go after the parents. Go after the, the people that are selling these products. Go after the C-stores. Go after what you need to go after to enforce the fucking law. Keep the hand, yeah. keep the keep the products out of the kids' uh, the hands, and leave the adults alone. Yeah, leave the adults alone because yeah. the only now, people that the bans are affecting at this point, right, aren't the kids because you already have T twenty one. Yeah, it's not the kids. Yeah. It's affecting yes. the adults. And it's affecting here, the smokers. It's affecting the businesses. It's affecting the manufacturers. It's affecting people that it shouldn't be affecting because you have T twenty one. It's frustrating. I think this is mostly right. talk all night. Now, Got me hot. Here, here's a funny thing that I like to get across. Y'all remember you have Walgreens and you have Rite Aid and you had CVS and yeah. all that drugstores and all. And CVS was one of the first ones to get rid of all the tobacco products. Yes. Because they opened okay, clinics. Well, here in our town, here in our town, they actually carry vape products in their drugstores now. And one of them is Cosmic Fog that I saw in there. And I was like, how did y'all eliminate all tobacco products? But you're only now selling vape products. And I, I I couldn't understand that. I, so like, I have you know, the answer if you want. So hard against tobacco products. But I, I have the answer if you want on that. <laughs> CVS made a deal with pharmaceutical companies to promote clinics and cessation products and drugs and chantix and patches and stuff like that. Uh, I think under the agreement, okay. though, vapor okay. products were not captured. So I think it was just for okay. combustible cigarettes. Okay. Uh, but I mean, I'm sure they're making tons more money. Uh, selling drugs, and they were uh, the percentage that they get off cigarettes as well, too. So I don't know. But anyway, right. Robbie, uh, all right. valid now points. I, I wish I, I had the answers to everything, but hopefully I was able to at least guide you a little bit. 
All right. Thank you. And hey, guys, I will try to be there for the rally. If not, y'all, please be safe. I know that thank there's you, still some issues with some groups up there that are still yeah. rioting and causing problems. So I want to make sure y'all be safe when y'all go out there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna have my bodyguard with me. His name is Phil Busardo. <laughs> <laughs> all right, buddy. All right, have, a good, have a good evening. All right, take care. Goodbye. Uh, yeah, this one, uh, Sam. You like Samuel L. Jackson? Yeah. You're a smart motherfucker. That's right. <laughs> I love that. I got a new soundboard, uh, but I haven't had a chance to um, use the other ones because uh, there hasn't been anything. All right, listen. You got 15 minutes to get any other questions. Speak now. From now on, if you're gonna bother me until September the 9th, you're gonna pay. I ain't free, bitches. I'm rich, bitch. We're right, already so, in after hours. <laughs> We're already in after hours. So you got 15 minutes. We're going to do a drawing for um, a couple of gifts from the live that we did last with Phil. Um, uh, Johnny with a five again. I'm just trying to light a fire and awareness of the vapors that people can actually get this done. Unfortunately, what does that super chat say? I'm going to make sure I can... I think it was just uh, unfortunately. Yeah. Johnny, yeah. man, listen... I give you all the commends in the world, but I'm also trying to tell you, don't be discouraged. I've been discouraged for the last 10 years in this vaping industry. Every time I've tried to do something good for this industry, I get fucked, and I'm still here. People every forget. Time, you forget. Every time we produce something that we want to see go viral. Do we, we forget Vape Free Youth in 2015? Do you guys forget the launch of Vape Free Youth, how much I got fucked by the industry that didn't want to change their labels? You forget about that. So it's not just you, Johnny. What I'm saying is that I understand what you're trying to do, but I also don't want you to feel like I'm ignoring you. All right? This, we've attempted a lot of things in this industry until this industry matures as, and, and understands the only way to reach consumers is to have a big PR campaign to be able to reach the people that don't even know that the PMTA is going to eliminate their products in 14 days. Because the majority of people that use these products in America don't know this is happening. You think they're going to sit here on a Tuesday night and get DP'd? No. <laughs> no. So um, so just take that under consideration. I appreciate what you're doing. I really do. Don't take it the wrong way. But the truth is that it's nearly impossible at this stage of the game. It, 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 uh, uh, it really is. All right. So last week we did, uh, we did a video with Phil. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. If you did, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a video where – let me uh, see if I can – Okay, so we did a video with Phil where we um, we did a little promotion for Anakin, kind of like a virtual show. And I said, anybody that puts comments underneath um, the uh, the video will get a chance to win an Anakin Scepter and uh, and an Ares too. Now, uh, and I also said somebody is going to make a stupid comment, and they did. Let me look at some of these comments down here. Some of this not great show. You find men, thank you. Uh, can't get rid of the thought. Phil looks like the Godfather of the Italian mafia from the '60s, and Demetrius is like his right hand. Uh, true. Also, you are such a great team. Thank you. Uh, just watch the replay. As always, you never disappoint. Thank you. Inican products always well made. Thank you. Uh, didn't know about the Easter egg underneath the Aries. Uh, glad that you got to see that. I like you guys. Only stream I watch the replay. Oh, thank you, Sally. Alicia, love both cool citrus and watermelon peach. That is a smart lady right there. Very, very diplomatic <laughs> answer. Uh, thank you for doing the show. An RBA for the scepter would be cool. Eh, I don't think that would be cool. Again, that would be geared towards existing vapors. Um, cutest guys at YouTube. Aw. Aw. Wait, is that that's from a, a girl or a guy? It's a girl. It's a Greek girl. Ephthemia. Oh, Ephthemia is a Greek uh, girl's name. Good. Uh, I came for the fish and coeds. Very, very smart. Uh, still say Demi and Phil look like Ray, Char uh, like Ray and Charlie from Rain Man in the casino shot. <laughs> I'll let you figure <laughs> out who, which one is. Uh, fun show. Would love to win. Uh, James Bonish. Uh, have a great day both. I want Here it is. <laughs> There's the comment of the week. Corona will not pass. It is here to stay like winter flu. Get used to it, fools. I knew somebody was going to make it. Like, completely irrelevant. That's what you were referring to. Yeah. You sent me. Yes. You sent me his name and you sent me the, uh, the, yes. the quote. But I had no idea where that quote came from. So I looked up his YouTube channel expecting like, like a video of that. Now I know. Bro, it has nothing to do with this two-hour show that we did. But somebody always pops up and says something like that. Yep. Smart people. Demetrius hair looking extra sprayed and full body. Thanks to Phil. Swagger lumps. Love you guys. That's a really good uh, good comment. That's somebody that's watched. 
Uh, great show. I don't care if I win something. I'm vaping and I'm feeling better. Congratulations to you. Good, good. Uh, gutter, I missed the show. Uh, I think feeling the media should get away from the bars and do a show from an amusement park where they get flinged. I thought that said get fingered from that swing fling ride. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, by the way, I saw your latest video, and I, I saw a lot of comments, people commenting on how good lo you look and uh, how much weight you lost. Oh. So, I, I did see yeah, people, that's uh, great. People say that. I really appreciate it. All right. Let's get some winners. I got the uh, YouTube URL here, and then if I go to here, shuffle, random, and pick a winner. First one is going to be for the Aries 2. Oh, I got to get the YouTube comments. And then start. The Aries 2 goes to... Sally S. That said, I like you guys. Only stream, I watch the replay. Wow. I even picked that comment as well. Good. Congratulations, Sally. Get a hold of me on Facebook. Uh, Facebook.com slash Vaping Greek. Send me a message. I'll see it in my other inbox with your name and your address, and I'll get it out to you. And now, the Inakin Sceptra. Skepter. Skep spectator? Sceptators. <laughs> Sep potatoes. And this is the deluxe kit, by the way. I just want to make sure that. Stephen so. Mao. Stephen Mao. Wonski, yeah, he's a great guy. Sorry I had to hop off the live work call. Thanks for the product showcase from Inigan. Congratulations, Steve Mal. I think I have you on Facebook. You have one this beautiful, sealed, by the way, deluxe edition of the Scepter. It has like four pods inside and device and all kinds of cool stuff. So congratulations. Steve Mal, you know the deal. Uh, thanks to Inigan for providing these products uh, for you as well, too. All right, let me go through some of these questions again, see if I have anything left. Uh, thanks for the $5 uh, super chat. Sorry about the static earlier at work. Planned a trip to DC six months ago to get engaged. Same week in S-Rally. Hope to see you guys there. Wow. Congratulations on your engagement. That'd be great. You can rally? Oh, look, Steve Miles in the chat as well, too. Congratulations, buddy. Um, you going to go to the rally to fight for vaping? And you're going to get... Um, Engaged. Engaged. Now listen, I don't normally give uh, relationship <laughs> advice oh on the DP show. Here My only advice to you is don't get married. Don't ever have kids. <laughs> that's the only advice to you. That's the perfect thing to tell uh, him now. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. That's the only advice I'm going to give you. Uh, all right. Um, thank you, Sergio. Sergio, thank you again. Love the Aries too. I have a couple Appreciate of them. Thank that. you for what you do for the industry. By the way, if you love the Aries, you're going to love the Limited edition that's coming out now. The Onyx here. Go check out the video. And, and the, Flint. the Flint. Phil has this presentation video up on his channel now. And we hope you enjoy him and you love him as much as uh, we do as well, too. And All thank right. you so much, Angela. It's very sweet. Thank you. What did Angela say? Can you read it back for people? Well, it says that I've always looked fine. Now I just look finer. Aw. Um, yeah. Whatever, Angela. Nothing about me? <laughs> Did you notice that I left the goatee? I haven't left the goatee in a very long time. Can you see it? Can you see my goatee? Feel? No. You can't see it? That's why I don't grow a beard. No, I can't see it. Are you, you're growing your goatee? Are you trying to like be just like me? No, no. I haven't left the goatee in, you know, three years. Huh. So I figured I'd just um, fix it up a little bit today. It's great. I don't like it. I'm going to shave it. Off. Get rid of it. Save it. I don't right. like change. I'm leaving mine just the way it is. Man, I think we covered everything. Uh, I think we did. You know the uh, the next DP show because there was a lot. There was a lot of vaping stuff. There was yeah. a lot of a lot of information. A lot of PM, A lot of good information. A lot of important information. But we didn't get to the wheel. Yeah, we, we, we should do, do something wheel. totally off the wall on the next DP show. Yeah, yeah. We should just talk about DP constantly. Let's um. And its effect on the population as a whole. <laughs> Let's do something with uh, with sex toys, since we keep talking, yes. talking about DP. Absolutely. We'll do a sex toy show. I, let, how about you go and find what you consider the most five interesting sex toys, and I'll do that for, for me, too, and then we'll present them on the show with links and everything. We got to be, be careful fun. on what we present, because you know YouTube will flag you. So well, no, not, not, not present. Just show, just show the links, right? But like, We can't present. Well, I mean, we can show the device, but we can't yeah. show it actually being used. <laughs> no, we're not going to show it being used. No, what the hell's wrong with you? Just go, just go online and find them. That's all. Okay. If you have any great ideas, you can leave them as a comment on this video as well, too. And maybe we'll talk about it. Anything that you want us to bring up. I think today, the reason why I did this 
and trust me, I put a lot of work into creating that presentation, is I'm tired of looking at people that, like, that look to Facebook to get answers to questions where they don't understand the process and why it's there. So hopefully this gave you a kind of a timeline on how we got there and also to explain to you in detail why the PMTA is not the right pathway for our products. It is the only pathway, unfortunately, but it's not the right. Now, whether you agree or disagree with the PMTA, no, that's none of my business. You do whatever you need to do, but if you're going to go fight for this product and ask for relief, at least understand what you're talking about. Don't embarrass yourself, don't embarrass the industry, and don't put the, don't put the person that you're talking to in a difficult position by giving them erroneous information. Right. Because that it, It's okay to say, I don't know. Yes. Right. Hey, you know, God, I hit the, the wrong the, button again. Hold on. You're a, um, you're usually a pretty good judge of, uh, uh of things and, and what's coming and, and uh, you know, being able to see into the future. So, w what's your percentage? What's your confidence or percentage that you would give on there being an extension or some kind of change hmm. between now and the deadline? Hmm. Huh. I think it's going to come. Do you it's, really? <laughs> I think it's going to be like very, very close to the deadline date. I, 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 I can't see how the argument that we made today. It's not a valid argument, meaning that due to COVID, every other agency has gotten some sort of relief, right? When we got the first pushback from May to September, everybody thought COVID would go away during the summer months because the heat kills the COVID. Whoever fucking public health Jerome Adams came up with that shit, right? But um, There's a lot of heat in Florida. There's a lot of heat in Florida. There's a lot of heat in his mouth on all the bullshit that he spews, but... <laughs> um, but it's still around. It's still affecting, right? It's still affecting businesses. It's still affecting operations. It's affecting travel. It's affecting lab work. It's affecting um, financials. Um, I don't even think 180 day extension is enough, but this is what we're asking for. I can't see how that's going to be denied. It, so I think that something went. Now, having said that, do I deter people from doing it? No. We should have done it last year, folks. We should have done it two years ago. Draft a PMTA with whatever you could possibly do. Do a good faith PMTA. You know, uh, it doesn't have to cost a million dollars. It can cost half a million dollars. It can cost $100,000. It can cost $20,000. Do something, though. We should have been doing this for a very long time. I am tired of people saying that we didn't see this coming. How can you? How can you possibly? Not, not, it's been around since 2014. How can you possibly not? We, I think that people, because of the extensions and Gottlieb and all that, I think people always kept thinking, "Oh, it's never going to come." Just right on our doorstep. Now, for granted, granted an extension, great, but that doesn't mean you should stop what you're doing now. You should work with a goal of completing it by September the 9th. If we get an extension, great. That just gives you more time to make your application even better, and more concise and better chances of it being accepted. Do I think that PMTAs will be granted? I don't know. If I knew this, I'd be a billionaire. I'd be rich, bitch, if I knew that. I don't know. But I do know that me personally, as Global E-Vapor Consulting, I didn't take any clients on that were not doing HPHC and stability testing. That's just me as Dimitri. Not because I don't care about the other people. All I'm saying is that if I'm going to submit a PMTA to the FDA, I want to do in good faith, at least meet the minimum statutory requirements. So I don't discourage people from doing PMTAs, whatever level they can afford or whatever level they can do. I think it's a good thing to be able to show to the FDA that you did everything you could possibly do to submit PMTA. But when you're competing with billion dollar PMTAs from PMI, you know, it's, it's, it's very a hard proposition. What we're looking for here is for the independent vaping industry to do their part. So continue to work, even if we get an extension, continue to work to, to make that better. All right. Do you see any other questions in the chat, Phil? No, no. They're having a little conversation about the Aries 2. Thank you for liking the Aries 2. I am going to be on the Mix and Vixens show. Again? Uh, That's bullshit. Jen. Yeah, yeah. That's bullshit. Uh, she, sent, she sent me those, those liquids that oh, were designed she? in my likeness. All right, so I will be. I'm. I'm not even. I'm going to vape those live on the show. I'm going to load them up. I'm going to have them in uh, in Zena tanks, ready to go, or slide tanks ready to go for the show. Uh -huh. So I look forward to spending more time with uh, 
with Jennifer and the Mixon Vixens. Yeah, uh, Joshua, what's up, Joshua? Nice to see you, buddy. The Aries 2 is not a restricted lung either, but does have a little bit more air. Yes. It clearly says on the says, bell that everybody complains. It says MTL about. on a bell. I don't can, know can you, can you show that. me the bell one more time? I just, I, it's not big yeah. enough. But you know what? It's going to be very confusing for people because the uh, the LE version. Yeah, it does not have it on. Doesn't, it, it doesn't have. But they're going to try to do restrict. That was you saying. The bell. But uh, yeah, that's the uh, that's the LE uh, Flint, and that is the LE. Why, why we didn't call this the murdered out as fuck uh, lit AF version? Yeah, I know. I agree with you. Why didn't we call it that? We should have. That would I think that would have created more uh, more hype on it. But yeah, those are the LEs right there, and we're excited. Cockadoodle, damn! Your smokers yeah. is excited as well too. That that video has like more views than a lot of my a lot of my All recent right. videos too. That's good. That's good. I mean, people want to see it, but people yeah. pe people uh, we really appreciate the the love that we've gotten on the Aries two, and we're happy that it manufactured correctly the way that we had designed it, unlike the Aries one. But if you do want a restricted direct lung, get the Aries one because <laughs> the Aries one is definitely losing. You can get a restricted uh, direct uh, lung. Um, but we do have some restricted direct lungs stuff coming as well too. So. Keep your eyes open. Um, are they pre-August 8th of 2016? No. They're not. <laughs> They're not. Uh, when are they coming out? Mid-September. The Aries well, that, 2 limited edition, mid-September. That was an interesting uh, thing that you said about the tobacco. I know we're after hours right now, but what, what you said uh, right at the very beginning of the show that um, not okay to be distributed and carried in stores, but okay for personal use. That's what I said. I will read so, it back to you. And again, I don't want people to take this the wrong way. I want people to understand what I'm saying here. Okay? So I will put it one more time. We're talking about the actual bill, the Tobacco Control Act. Okay? The bill makes no provisions that ban the import of the banned items for personal consumption only for sale or distribution. That sounds like uh, Phil and Dimitri's vaping emporium uh, based in Greece. Based in the Caribbean. You can yes. play poker and based get in the Caribbean, vape. Even better. Yep. But yeah, uh, I, again, I, I, you can interpret that whichever way you want, but as a consumer, you shouldn't worry about it. As a consumer, what well, you should be worried about the access to these products so you can continue to vape, right? If that means you have to order in China, if that means... If you're selling into New York right now, I can't fault you. People in New York need to get their flavored products. They need to get, you know, their, their liquids to stay off cigarettes. So, you know, fuck Cuomo, fuck New York, fuck all of them. I don't care. Um, and if you're a shop owner, you shouldn't be concerned about the PMTA because you don't, unless you make liquid. If you don't make liquid, if you're just a retailer, you shouldn't be concerned. Continue to sell until the FDA busts down your doors and starts seizing product. I don't see that happening. The manufacturer will receive a letter before you do. You know, I, I find it really hard for them to come into a vape shop and say, we're going to seize all this product because it hasn't filed a PMTA. I mean, the manpower that would require for them to do that. So all I'm saying is continue to sell. If there's a demand for the products, continue to sell them. There's some companies going out of business that have announced it, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, but for the other products that you carry... It, it, just because somebody files or tells you they're going to follow PMTA, that shouldn't like take the worry off your head and say, oh, I'm only going to carry the products of people that said they're going to follow PMTA. Because I guarantee there's going to be a lot of PMTAs that are going to be rejected right off the bat. But continue to sell. Continue to keep the harm reduction going. Continue to offer the products that your customers want. Your customers deserve it, right? Your customers deserve it because that's who built your business. So continue to sell. And companies continue to make them until somebody busts in and tells you, tells you that you can't do it anymore. And then we'll cross that line when we get there. So um, a little civil disobedience is what I'm saying. You hear that, Jerome Adams? We're coming after you, buddy. Um, I, would, I would love a cage match between you and Jerome Adams fun. or like a sit down or like a debate. It would be I so would love to fun. debate him. It I would, would crush him. It would be so much fun to watch. I would crush him. You would. You absolutely would. Um, shut up shop in Mexico and Canada. Time to start vaping vodka. Paint your goatee. <laughs> uh, that's a good idea, Costello. But you know, um, you know what I'm afraid of? Like in in the face. Like if you if you dye your hair, it can turn out like really bad. Like my father in law used to dye his goatee. You know, he's 80 years old. And it looks bad. And it looked like 
he took like a black coal piece and just stuck it on his chin. It looks so bad. So you got to GX, really man. It's it's, it's life changing. Yeah, but you can't do it on your goatee. I think they make one for the goatee now. Oh, really? The, I, I need I to use look. it in I, my I hair. It I works. Saw one and I'll look at it. Yeah, I don't know if if it would work. It might take a long time. And I can't really grow any hair. I mean, you've seen how my my beard comes in. It oh, looks mine, like mine will be like boof. if I if I don't trim this thing every day, it'll yeah. be ridiculous. Mine, I can't. But, be like, but I noticed like the Control GX. It doesn't it miss because it's, it's short or... there. Yeah, me, mine the same yeah. too. It's here on the side because yeah, 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 yeah. I cut my hair short. No, but up here. But I think I think I think I need a little bit of gray in there. I don't. I think I would look right with all like you know people be like that's right. what's going on. <laughs> Maybe we do an episode on that as well. Too. <laughs> uh, do you think about using hair in a can for his goatee? No, no, <laughs> no. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Oh, please, um, please spray that on your face. <laughs> maybe one day we'll do it for fun. Maybe when you come up here, you're coming up here. So you're going to spend some time here in Chattanooga. We'll do some lives from here, from the uh, from the man yes. cave down here. So it'll be fun. Uh, my local vape shop in my band area still sells flavors, and I love her for it. Absolutely, Johnny. I love her, too. Tell her that I love her as well, too. All right. Bro, we covered everything. Two and a half hours. Listen, I just want to reiterate. I am not an attorney. Do not take what I said today legal advice. It's just um, a time frame of how we got to uh, the PMTA from the invent of the Tobacco Control Act. That's all it is. It's just information that I can share with you. To at least try to educate you on the subject. I hope I did a great job. Please leave me some comments if you did, if you liked it. But um, don't take it as legal advice. Don't take it as the Bible. Go out there and do your own research. But definitely don't make statements simply because you read it in a chat or you heard some, you know, other guy saying something on a live show or something like that. Do I just want research. to give you kudos, uh, Dimitri. You did a really good job. I mean, it, it was it was really good. It was almost as good. As the number one best-selling flavor in the unsalted line, the delicious watermelon peach. But no, seriously, good job, bud. Thanks, buddy. Uh, Demi, Jennifer says, Demi, you have to buy the mushroom colors. It won't be too dark. The mushroom? Is there a mushroom color? No, it's a mushroom color. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, yeah. So anyway, this episode will be up here for, of course, on the replay. So if you get questions about it or you want to send it to somebody to find why we are here, they can actually watch this and... You know, I, I wish politicians would watch it as well, too. I think it's long, but I think that, you know, in an hour and a half, if we cut out that segment, I think if they're really interested to understand what's, what this industry is going through, it, it clearly shows that that the way that this was designed was not designed for favorite products. And I think that's clear all, all the way across. Again, unless the FDA determines that, you, you know, we know, so here's a little, you know, discretion on how you're going to follow your PMTAs, which is possible. It's definitely possible. Will it happen? I don't know. Yo, some final words from you, buddy, before we wrap. Jeez. Uh, no, that's it. I, 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 again, great job. Uh, you do share the uh, do share the show. Please do subscribe. Please do like. And you know, I I did get an email uh, this week from somebody that it was a really good idea. And, and Dimitri and I are talking about it. I think we would need help with it. So if any of you guys uh, want want to talk more about it, but kind of like a um, a clips show right so go through these rather long shows find the important clips and cut those out uh and maybe we do like quick clips as well uh so it's something to think about we're also looking for ideas uh for the next season of the smoker show all right because we've been through a lot we have an amazing slide package for the the smoker show but we're looking for a different topics uh that that you guys would think uh you guys think would be important for smokers uh to know outside of what we've already presented and uh, that's all i have to say uh, here so you can get a hold of us on our emails you know you know how to get a hold of us by now so that's it go ahead Dave. yes on facebook yeah and, and i know you didn't talk a lot today and i, I had a lot to say but i i it, you know, it's okay. Let's, uh, you know, yeah, sometimes I talk more, and sometimes you talk more. Yeah, it's okay. You I don't, talk don't, most don't, of don't, don't, don't. I tell you what, when I talk the most is when I do the show with Bill, and not you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, cutting out the, the the good the points from here. Uh, yeah, I think it's um, it's a good idea. I wish we had somebody that we could you know hire to do stuff like that. It's because yeah. it's a lot of work for us. Uh, it's easier now that we're not traveling, but that's going to change uh, at some point, and we're going to have to start traveling again. But uh, we'll see. We'll try to do something. We'll, we'll try to get it out there. Uh, Ricky Mahoney, this was the most info I've consumed in two hours in the last 10 years. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. That's really, really nice. I really, really appreciate uh, comments. Like, it just makes me feel good, and I can continue to do these shows. So, 
Uh, the DP show. Button again. I got so many good good stuff on my. Board. You got a lot of buttons going on there, buddy. It's, it's okay. It's, it's my favorite though. Oh my! Opinions from both ends. You are listening to the DP show with Dimmy and Phil. You, you got mostly opinions from one end uh, today, but uh, have a wonderful evening. <laughs>